Good morning <clears throat> and welcome to this session, On the Road to Automated Vehicles. Um, and hello from the Iowa National Office in Manassas, Virginia, near Washington, DC. Before we begin, I would like to explain some of the features of the webinar software. Um, at our in-person conferences, we all enjoy discussions in the hallway and being able to visit with colleagues and friends from around the world. Um, and we have some features in the software that will allow us to enjoy some of those abilities today. First of all, if you have a question for one of our panelists, in the viewer, you can click on the Q&A button and you can type your question in there. Moderators will read questions to our panelists at appropriate times during the session. There is also separately a chat button. If you click on the chat button, you can send a message to all of our attendees today. Uh, be sure not to put your questions for our speakers in the chat. You can put those in the Q&A, but feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself. You might want to right now drop a message in the chat and let us know where you're watching from today. Here in Virginia, we've just had breakfast. It's morning, but we know that around the world, there are people who are having lunch, dinner, and some who are even up late at night. And we welcome all of you, and we're glad to have you here. I would now like to introduce our moderators for today's session. Uh, Dr. Dorota Brzezinska is an endowed chair, university distinguished professor, and associate dean for research at The Ohio State University where she also leads the Satellite Positioning and Inertial Navigation Laboratory. She is an IAG, RIN, and ION Fellow, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and currently serves on the National P&T Advisory Board. Dr. Tyler Reed is a co-founder and CTO of Zona Space Systems, a startup focused on GNSS augmentation from low Earth orbit. Previously, Tyler worked as a research engineer with the controls and automated systems team at Ford Motor Company, working in localization and mapping for self-driving cars. We are pleased to welcome Dorota and Tyler, and we turn the time over to them. Thank you. Rick, thank you for that kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Good morning, and I guess I should also say good afternoon and good evening. And welcome to ION GNSS 2020 and to our panel on the road to autonomous vehicles. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Unfortunately, Rick, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Should I be seeing that? <laughs> there you go. Try it now, Tyler. Ah. Thank you so much. All right, I hope that's coming through for everyone. How does that look all right? All right, very good. Well, I thought I would kick things off um, with a throwback to last year. So going back to 2019, you know, one, just, you know, nice memories of getting together in person, uh, but also because this was a really fun sign to see in Miami, which this is a real sign. It's, you know, no parking, autonomous vehicles only. Um, and the reason why this was relevant to me was, you know, at the time I was working at Ford Motor Company, uh, which is closely affiliated with Argo AI, where, where one of our panelists is coming from today. And, and the reason why that's relevant is that Miami is one of the cities that was selected for their you know, on the road testing campaigns for, for automated driving. And so what's really fun about this is I think it shows a few things. One is it shows you know, how real this, these, these uh, vehicles are, are becoming and, and how they're actually starting to shape our cities. And so to, to continue our welcome here, go. Um, just to give some idea of, of logistics of, of how, th how things will go this morning, uh, we'll start with a, a brief introduction from, from myself and, and Dorota. Um, then we are pleased to have our distinguished panelists with us this morning. And, and um, as you might notice, we have three panelists. Uh, compared to other years, this may seem like less than usual, but uh, this, you know, the, of course, this is partly due to uncertainty associated with COVID-19. Uh, but we are very thankful uh, for our panelists for joining us today. And we very much look forward to the discussion. Um, due to the smaller panel, we may be targeting a shorter time slot, so just to, just to warn you, it may not quite be the full four hours, uh, but we thank you for, for accommodating us on this. And to go further back in time, I'd like to go back to the year 2016, uh, when the future of autonomy was bright. And really, every news article that was coming out at the time said something along the lines of, self-driving cars will be here in five years. And there's huge investment coming from not just you know, technology companies, but also the major auto industry. So places like Ford Motor Company, uh, Bosch, Daimler, Uber, Volvo. And 
all of these had the same prediction, which is that in five years, 2021, we will have self-driving. And not only will it exist, but it will be commonplace, you know, to the extent where some made the comments of, you know, majority of rides, you know, things like ride sharing will be made by self-driving cars in 2021. Fast forwarding to now, you know, nearly, you know, nearly those five years later, you know, we're just shy of, you know, 2021 now, we're on, on the eve of that year. And the news articles are somewhat different. And it's not to say that it's completely grim, uh, but I think the reality of the challenge of self-driving has started to set in and you can start to see some of the experts coming forth and saying that, well, you know, that five-year deadline that, that we set for ourselves, uh, well, perhaps we're 10 years away from that and we're already five years behind. And so, you know, what, what has caused this? I think that, you know, there's a lot of things going on out there in the industry that have, I think, just shown the reality of the difficulty of the challenge. Um, but I think that this just says that perhaps self-driving cars are not quite as close as, as we thought they were five years ago. To give an idea of some of the technology challenges here, I thought I'd take some time to go through, you know, what is, what are the pieces that make up a self-driving car? And of course, there are, are many different ways to do this. Um, but, you know, we thought, but to give the general sense of what the autonom autonomous stack looks like, generally speaking, there are five major components. But they all start with localization, uh, which is a topic I think near and dear to all of us. And so it starts with where am I in the world? And the reason this is important is that that's context to your location. You know, where am I with respect to a map? You know, what's around me? What are the rules of the road? What are the things that I should be concerned about? Then perception. What's around me? Where are the other players in the scene that I should be aware of, whether they be vehicles, whether they be pedestrians? Next up is prediction. Where are all those objects going? And of course, they have to follow the rules of the road, uh, but to some extent, it is a more complicated problem than that because humans are not always predictable. Following that, we have planning. So that is, you know, in this chaos of the scene and all that's going on, this is, you know, where should I go? And then finally, you know, execute control to, to actually get to where you're trying to get to. But at the root of this problem, you know, really is localization. And often, at least in the systems that I've seen in my experience, localization, you know, being foundational, really feeds into these other systems and errors tend to propagate downstream. And so because of that, localization often has some of the strictest requirements in these systems to make them, to make them work and to make them safe. And to tie this to the real world and, you know, why, you know, localization is important, I'd like to just give this picture, and I think this starts to decide, you know, why localization is so important. It really ties into the physical world, and it really brings it down to, you know, if you're trying to keep a vehicle within the lane, and, you know, you know what does it take to, to, to maintain that? And to give a sense of this, you know, vehicles are, you know, around two meters wide, and at least in, in North America. Uh, lanes are between three and, you know, three and a half meters wide, 3.6 meters wide on the highway. And what's left over is your tolerance, which you know, ends up being not very much. And when you combine that with the level of safety that these systems uh, really are mandating, you end up with needing you know, decimeters of accuracy to do this job well. And this is needed not just for your vehicle to, to maintain it perhaps within its lane, uh, but also when you think of this in a more collaborative environment where vehicles are sharing information with each other and are trying to share this physical space together uh, and work in a collaborative environment, uh, and where you can start to gain more safety through this, uh, you know, collaborative system working together. Um, this is really where this, in, this location information and its integrity becomes important. And so you can think of an example of this, you know, if you're, if you're really trying to anticipate things that are coming around the corner, uh, perhaps, you know, sharing a sensor that has x-ray vision that allows you to see around a corner is a difficult challenge with being able to share location with others to really get you that full picture and that full situational awareness. Uh, is, is really, I think, tantamount to the success of autonomy. And so the road to autonomy really has many stops along the way. And so these are the topics that we hope to dive into with our panelists, and we, and we welcome all of you to, to participate today, and thank you all for, for joining us. And so what we would like to, to do is we, we welcome you to, um, we do have some, uh, some discussion, but we would like to, um, you know, welcome all of you to use the Q&A section of the, uh, of this uh, of this feature of Zoom, but to you know to I guess start things off with some thought provoking questions here, and you know what what are those some of those stops on the way to, to autonomous vehicles? Well, I think the first one really is the problem definition, and I think that you know what is an autonomous vehicle is still to some extent an open question because you've probably heard of all these different levels of 
autonomy, you know, level two autonomy, level four autonomy. And I think that there's still on some uncertainty as to, you know, what is the role of the driver in some of these systems? What is the target level of safety? Uh, what is the operational design domain? Um, is this a system that's meant to augment? Is it a system that's meant to really take over? Um, I think that some of those lines are, are still are still being defined and the requirements of what actually entails an autonomous vehicle is something that, uh, that is still coming together. I think that there are still challenges with building the technology. So, you know, what is the right combination of sensors and systems to, to actually achieve those goals? And what is the right balance between investment in infrastructure and perhaps redesigning our roads and, and creating a new paradigm for ourselves versus, say, building cars that can drive with us humans, which are you know, difficult things to drive alongside with, and I think is where many of the challenges come from. And what is the right level of redundancy? And, and how do we do this in a way that results in a cost viable solution uh, that can actually be fielded? And I think many of the research platforms out there today are, are very expensive, but as, as many of you can appreciate, you know, these are $500,000 vehicles and are not the kind of thing that are, that are easily fielded. And often they don't work in weather. Uh, there's you know, ultimately a reason why, you know, things like <clears throat> many of the autonomous vehicle platforms today are, are beginning operations in sunny places like California, Arizona, because there are so many challenges on the weather front. And then finally, it's not finally, but the next step on the road is, you know, verification and validation. How do you check that you've actually met those requirements? Automotive safety integrity level B or ASIL B, which is the gold standard in automotive, is a probability of failure of 10 to the minus 8 per hour. And so to put that in perhaps more tangible units, that's approximately one failure per billion miles of driving. And so a billion miles is, to, to put that further in context, is 250 times the entire U.S. road network. And so proof by miles driven really becomes an intangible exercise when you're trying to prove systems that you know, really have never been fielded um, and you know, make use of you know, AI, which makes it tough to, to quantify safety. Next up is standards and regulation. You know, who is responsible for crashes ultimately? And what is the legal framework and ethical framework that forms the bridge to ultimately acceptance in our society? And so these are the questions that we want to dive into today with our panel members and, and our experts in the field. And so, Dorota, with that, I will I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. Thank you very much, um, Tyler. And let me add my welcome to everyone. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are really glad that um, you were able to join, uh, regardless of your time zone. Obviously, the topic is, um, is, is of, of high interest, and we are very happy that so many people um, were able to join us. So with that, it's my pleasure now to introduce our three panelists. Um, let me start with Dr. Ashley Clark. Ashley comes from an aerospace engineering background, beginning in test engineering for aircraft and spacecraft and then move into flight navigation and control software for small satellites at NASA Ames. Um, she did her PhD research at Stanford and localization and mapping tech, I'm sorry, on localization and mapping techniques in GNSS denied environments with a focus on underwater and deep space applications. She now works for Argo AI, designing verifications and validation strategies for autonomous vehicles with a focus on localization and mapping. Ashley, welcome. Our second panelist um, is Dr. Niels uh, Jubert, um, who is currently with Uber um, ATG. Um, Niels received his Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD um, in computer science from Stanford University. Welcome, Niels. Um, the third panelist is uh, Joab Zangvil, Chief Technology Officer, a co-founder of Regular Cyber. Um, he oversees the development of mechanical, electrical, and software solutions to address security threats through GPS GNSS. Regulus is the first company providing software cybersecurity solutions for satellite-based positioning and time. Yoav has uh, deep expertise in encryption, microcontrollers, motion control, telecommunications protocol, military um, UAVs, and robotics. He has been dealing with remote control and autonomous systems for over 15 years. And prior to joining Regulus, Yoav was a systems engineer at Elbit Systems, where he specialized in communications, sensors, and autonomous defense technology. Yoav has also held engineering management roles at Advancing, Advanced Dicing Technology, ADT, Rafael Advanced Defense System, 
Converse and Exceling and began his career in the technology division of the Israeli um, Defense Forces. Yoav holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, where he majors in Robotics, Dynamics and Control Systems. Welcome, Yoav. So uh, with that, um, uh, I think it's time for a brief um, introductory remarks from our panelists. And again, I would like to go back um, to Ashley. Um, Ashley, the mic is yours. Great. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you for having me here today on this panel. I'm very excited to be participating in Eye on this here. Um, so as Dorota mentioned, I spent some of my time doing flight controls and also test engineering for aircraft and spacecraft uh, in the aerospace industry. And in recent years, I've been a software developer for localization and mapping for various autonomous vehicles. Um, coming from an aerospace background, but also working as a software developer, one of my favorite things to think about that I'm very passionate about is how can we take the two philosophies from these two very different industries and bring them together for autonomous driving systems. Um, on the aerospace side of things, there's this very heavy focus on safety. Um, if you have a design decision to make, there's no question that if it's a question of a trade-off between safety um, and novel functional development, we're going to go towards the, the safer aspect there. Um, however, in the field of computer programming, most computer scientists, if you're working on an application that's a website or a cell phone app, safety is not necessarily the main criteria that you're thinking about because safety might not necessarily be relevant to your product. Um, however, what you're really looking for is a fast development cycle and quick turnaround to really get the edge on the market. Um, and at first blush, these two things might seem like they don't necessarily fit together very well. But for autonomous driving, this is a safety critical system, but it's also heavily dependent on software development. Um, so how can we really take these two uh, mentalities and merge them together into one successful safe system? Uh, and one of the ways I like to look at this is uh, in software development, we have agile development methodologies where we try and build a baseline system and then add incremental performance improvements on top of that. And actually, if you think about it, in the aerospace industry, we take a similar approach with these incremental developments. However, we're working on a 10-year sprint cycle rather than a 10-day sprint cycle. Um, so that's one of the things I, I like to think about in my role here at Argo AI, um, doing verification and validation methods for autonomous systems. How can we take this agile development mentality and merge it with some of the testing strategies and approaches that are more common in the aerospace industry? Uh, so I'm kind of a translator in the technological sense in between our systems engineering teams and our software development teams. Also, uh, one of the cool opportunities that we have here at Argo is that I also get a chance to act as a translator between different cultures. Um, you may have heard that as recently as June, Argo AI acquired Autonomous Intelligent Driving, which was the Center for Autonomous Driving for the Volkswagen Group. Um, so therefore, Argo AI has now become one of the first like, international self-driving systems. Uh, so not only do we have our fun technological challenges to account for, but we also get to look into what are the different design criteria that we need in order to account for American driving styles and German driving styles and really unify our approaches across these different cultural boundaries. All right. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, so the, uh, the next panelist um, I'd like to invite to uh, make his introductory remarks is Niels. Niels, the mic is yours. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, very early here on the West Coast, um, but I've had my morning cup of coffee, so I'm feeling good. Um, 
I uh, should start off by just making the, uh, the important statement that everything I'll be saying through this panel is statements of my own. They're not official statements from Uber. And any forward-looking statements are my personal best estimates as of today. And they should not be interpreted as material plans for Uber and should not be relied on after today. Uh, this industry is moving so fast that um, that is generally true. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, yeah, we've been asked to make a statement that explains our point of view. And I'm primarily an engineer. And so my focus throughout today will be very much on the engineering component of the problem of autonomous driving. And uh, as has already been remarked, the engineering component is just one of many components. Um, so if we pose the question, how do we build robots to solve the dynamic driving task? Uh, naturally, we start looking at the dynamic driving task with an engineering eye. And uh, what we find is that we can factor this driving into a several broad modes of driving. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising, but it's uh, it's incredibly powerful to split driving into these modes. And let me just give a couple of examples. Uh, one type of driving is driving in very highly controlled environments where we encounter a very small set of actors and uh, the actor behavior is also from fairly small set of, of possible behaviors. Uh, this is pretty much what our controlled access highways look like. Uh, the rules are really quite strict for driving on a highway. You stay around 65 miles an hour. You're not allowed to stop. Uh, there's a small set of cars, trucks, motorcycles. Um, there's no humans, for example. There's no uh, pedestrians crossing the road. Uh, what's also interesting about highways is that we've already built large publicly funded systems that ensures that the environment stays conforming to these rules. So, for example, in California, uh, Caltrans does continual 24-7 work to try and clear road debris off the road, uh, and they have a highway hotline that you call and say, I saw de debris on the road, and they will clear that. Um, similarly, the California Highway Patrol in California ensures that ca cars don't move too fast or they don't move too slow. They regulate blockages, and they respond quite quickly. Um, this is very different for, from the type of driving that's characterized by the surface being the real challenge. And this is where a lot of uh, off-road enthusiasts spend their time. Um, the, the challenge of, net, of, of avoiding other actors is, is basically missing from off-road driving. The real challenge is navigating very complex road surface. Uh, another challenge is uh, another type of driving, another mode of driving is where the challenge is really the vehicle dynamics. Um, Stanford's Dynamic Driving Lab has a fantastic video from a couple of years ago that shows how they're drifting a, uh, an electric car fully autonomously. And it's on a large open uh, parking lot with no other actors. And the breakthrough is showing how you can control the vehicle even in this uh, sliding mode. And then of course, another type of driving is when we drive in very unstructured environments where we encounter a huge range of different actor behaviors and different actor types. And this is what our urban areas look like. Uh, the rules, although there is a, uh, a complex set of rules that we'll study as part of our driving test, the rules are really only loosely enforced and they have to be loosely enforced else our cities don't function. Um, just as an example, um, in the Mission District in San Francisco, you encounter a stopped vehicle that partially blocks your lane approximately every three miles of driving. Uh, many of these are technically violating the rules of the road, but we couldn't do delivery. We couldn't do ride share pick up and drop offs, for example, if we didn't allow this. And so since these environments are, are so different, it's not surprising that we, at least at this point in development, we have very different engineering approaches to solving autonomy in these different environments. Now at, at Uber, it's worth reiterating that our goal is to end car ownership. And uh, as of 2018, um, publicly we've disclosed that we've completed over 10 billion trips. And that was you know, over two years ago. And we're significantly beyond that by now. Um, now if you consider that 10 billion trips is a very, very large amount of data that we've collected on uh, where do people like being picked up? Where do they like being dropped off? in different cities, what does the trips look like? And so we, uh, of anyone, have the best understanding of what the market looks like for on-demand mobility. And from this understanding, 
uh, we're very interested particularly in the particularly in this last case for urban mobility so for us we're very much tackling this complex unstructured urban environment because we know that that's where uh, at least for our goals uh, the, the most value is in the near term so if we zoom in on that and we say, okay, how do we solve the urban driving problem? What's very interesting is that uh, one approach you can take is you break this problem into a hierarchy of problems. If we were driving, um, say, very late at night or during a shelter in place, as we've had, uh, the environment suddenly looks like a, you can, you can factor the problem as driving through a static map. If I understand the environment beforehand and there are no dynamic actors, suddenly the problem doesn't actually look that hard. It looks very similar to the kind of autonomy we've deployed in mining and agri agriculture to great success, where you say uh, there's an autonomous harvester that's busy plowing this field, no other actors are present, and so suddenly it becomes lane following in a known environment. And if you make this uh, if you factor the problem this way, if you make, uh, if you if you buy into this hierarchy, then a core challenge of autonomy is dealing with all of the changes to the static world. Uh, what's all the dynamic actors up to? What is all unexpected blockages that you encounter? And we really like this split because this lets us put all of our engineering effort into the unexpected. Um, other approaches factor this problem quite differently. We're actually you put a lot more effort on just in real time, in dynamically understanding the static environment, where if you were to drive the same route uh, for a year, you would be doing similar computation work to understand the static environment over and over and over again, versus we like to factor that out. Now to do that, we absolutely see localization and mapping as foundational to our efforts. Uh, because we separate the problem into the problem of driving through a fixed environment and then dealing with all of the dynamic changes to the environment, to solve that fixed environment problem, we absolutely rely on localization and mapping. And because we can factor that out, uh, we see that as, as a smart engineering approach. And because that is so foundational to us, it's I'm very excited here to talk to the GNSS community since we see the work that's happening here as foundational to enabling us. So um, I'm looking forward to the panel. We've got great questions and uh, I'm very excited to see the very large number. We're up to 100 and over 150 participants. So we're excited also to take your questions from the audience. Thank you very much. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, Joab. Yes, yeah, so hello everybody. Um, again, thank you for taking the time to join the panel. Um, so, Ever since uh, my early childhood, I, I really loved playing uh, uh, with Legos, Meccano, uh, model trains, and of course, RC cars and planes. Uh, actually, my first gas-powered plane didn't even have a remote control. It was tethered and, and actually crashed and burned the first time I, I tried to fly it. Uh, so I, I was really interested in the hardware side of things, uh, but pretty quickly I figured out uh, that without software skills, I wouldn't get far. So I basically learned how to code uh, and sold uh, my first software when I was uh, 17, that was back in 1996. Uh, so my first views of the autonomous revolution came to light in the form of a presentation I put together uh, in 2001, uh, just before I started my uh, BSc in uh, Technion. Uh, and in that presentation, I detailed my ideas on how we can actually reach full autonomy, and that was using the technology uh, we had back then. Uh, so a few years later, the 2004 uh, DARPA Grand Challenge proved to me how bad uh, that technology that we had back then was bad. Uh, as none of the participants were able to complete uh, the 150 mile route uh, that the challenge uh, uh, had, uh, the best car was able to complete about seven miles. With five, the challenge, uh, the thing, things looked uh, much better. Uh, there were about 195 applicants. 23 actually made it to the race, uh, but only five were able to complete the route. Still not the autonomous future we're actually hoping for. So fast forward 15 years to 2020, uh, we still face a huge challenge of making a computer drive a car the same way uh, as human ever imagined, obviously making it uh, drive it much better. Uh, so questions like, do we really need a computer to drive a car like a human does? Should we design those cars to interact with human drivers come to mind? 
Uh, it is clear we are on the way to an autonomous future, uh, but the route we choose today will actually determine how many years the, the, tra the transition period will take. Between now, uh, where we have a fraction of percent of uh, fully autonomous cars, uh, I won't even call them fully autonomous, but let's call them fully autonomous, uh, which are on the road to the time we will have 100% of the cars uh, on the road uh, fully autonomous. So if you look at the challenge, why is it so complicated? Uh, it all comes down to the number of freedom levels, the way I look at it. In the air, uh, autonomous drones, they have three dimensions. Uh, it's easier to correct mistakes. They have uh, more room for uh, mistakes. At sea, we come down to uh, two degrees of freedom. Uh, but on the road, uh, we have what I call 1.1 uh, degrees of freedom, basically uh, going back and the, the small ability to steer the car. Um, so there is, we all understand there is very uh, little room for error. Uh, the other challenge is uh, dealing with all of the edge cases, as Niels uh, uh, pointed out. Uh, driving on a highway is, is relatively easy. Uh, just think uh, if you're driving a city, uh, how many uh, edge cases or uncertainties you encounter in, uh, let's say, a 20 minute commute to work. So these challenges, they uh, obviously have to be dealt with. Uh, and it is not an easy uh, challenge, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, as technology improves, as the English improves, which is a big part of the solution, uh, in my opinion. Is, uh, is clear and we will reach it. Only the question is, we've been 5, 10, 15 or 20 years. All right. Thank you so much um, to all panelists. I think we are ready right now to open the floor for questions. And again, let me remind all the participants, there is a QA box at the bottom of your, of your screen. Please pose those questions there. And Tyler and I will take the liberty to choose which question will be asked. So since I have a mic now, I take the liberty to ask the first question. So, um, Ashley, um, this question is, is for you. If you could comment a little bit on what are the remaining challenges that hold back self-driving vehicles um, from the mass market? Sure. Um, so, ultimately, the challenges that we, we face here are very multidimensional. Um, there, there's obviously some technical hurdles we need to get over. Um, we need societal acceptance. And ultimately, we also need to define a set of regulations with local and federal governments uh, to make sure that we're operating safely. And we define exactly what safely means. Um, Self-driving cars remain one of today's biggest technical challenges. Uh, and acceptance from society and the right regulation is, is necessary to make it widely available. As we saw in one of the talks yesterday, um, there are plenty of examples of societal acceptance barriers all the way from one extreme of people not really accepting self-driving technologies. I've heard some stories of people throwing trash at autonomous vehicles in San Francisco, which is not really good for sensor field of view. Um, all the way to over acceptance of autonomous driving technologies, such as people falling asleep at the wheel in Tesla's when the Tesla system is not actually fully autonomous and needs driver supervision. Um, so hopefully as we gradually roll out these technologies and introduce them bit by bit, this should stabilize and become um, better better tempered in societal expectations one of the um but it's important to remember that as we roll these things out it'll happen slowly and and gradually things will adjust and calibrate but one of the other big problems that we have is how do we actually verify that the system is safe once society accepts it we, we want these cars to be operating in a way that improves the safety of other road users um, but it's not necessarily feasible to drive a billion miles with every single software release. So how can we design our systems up front uh, with enough redundancy in the uh, different sensors and uh, algorithms such that 
we can make testing feasible um, for every different iteration of the vehicles that we're, we're rolling out. Um, and then additionally, how do we define what exactly is safe? What uh, driving behaviors are acceptable? Um, this is something that's highly context dependent and subjective. So how can we translate that into a concrete set of rules and regulations that are measurable and definable? Um, so one of the approaches that we're taking at Argo is uh, we're doing a street by street, block by block rollout, uh, meaning that we design, uh, decide on a specific subset of the ODD, a subset of a city that we want to tackle, really knock out, um, verifying the functionality in, in those um, small areas and test it and gradually expand so that for every incremental step of development, we can actually take the time to make sure that it's validated appropriately and successfully. And this is something that like we need to keep working on together with auto manufacturers, self-driving companies, and also make sure that we get the appropriate regulatory and government organizations in the loop as well. All right. Well, thank you, Ashley. Um, you have Niels. Um, do you have anything to add, particularly um, in what's in your opinion are those primary bottlenecks? Are they technical, societal, or regulatory? If you can just throw in a couple of. Um... Uh, I say that in my opinion, the bottleneck is obviously a combination. Uh, we understand that regulatory issues uh, step in. Insurance is a, a big issue. The infrastructure in some areas is not uh, good enough for, for uh, AV. Obviously, evolving. Uh, it's also very important. Uh, and the, the whole issue of cybersecurity, which is what the regular cyber uh, is dealing with. Uh, I think we all agree. That the job we have now is, is much harder uh, than uh, it will be once 100% of the cars on the road will be autonomous. Right now we have to uh, deal with the, the poor infrastructure we have, we have humans and drivers with the AVs, uh, which make the development of uh, an AI or algorithm that control the cars much more complicated. Uh, and imagine um, uh, in 5, 10, 15 years from now when we will have uh, fully autonomous cars, 100% uh, of them. Obviously, I uh, will have much uh, less of these interactions, if any. The infrastructure will be better built, so uh, the, the AVs will not have to be so complicated uh, as they are today. So someone needs to step up and decide, uh, do we improve today the infrastructure? Uh, do we limit the interaction between uh, AVs and human drivers? If so, how do we do it? Uh, I don't have a clear answer. It's important to it. Uh, as the stakes are very high and the cost of a mistake is even higher. Uh, so it's a very good question and I guess time will tell. Uh, you are, I have a comment. Um, you are breaking every so often. I wonder if this is the bandwidth on your side. Perhaps you may try to either post your picture or just don't do video and see now if we can get a better voice. Okay, stop the video. Do you hear me better now? Yes, I think it's better now. Thank you. Okay, so I will turn off the video for now. All right, Niels, would you like to add some comments to the question? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, I think this is probably the core question that many people have. Um, I do believe the bottlenecks are primarily technical. Uh, nobody is being held back with a self-driving car ready to go and saying, oh, if only people were to accept it or if only we could get regulatory approval. And we definitely move slower because we wanna be very sensitive to regulatory approval, to safety considerations, regardless of regulatory approval and to how this will integrate into society. Um, every feature that we develop at Uber goes through a, an external uh, safety review board um, that takes significant time to do a lot of due diligence and we're very much committed to that. Um, if you look at uh, our self-driving car website, we, are, um, we have a significant safety plan that's, that we've been very public about. 
and, and yes, this does take time, but I wouldn't say this is primarily like the bottleneck that needs to be overcome. I think it, it really is at its core, very much still a technical challenge. And to dig into that a little bit, it's very much a technical challenge of scaling up. Uh, we, we've had technological demonstrators for years now, and, and as an industry, we've done that. And uh, if when people ask, you know, when can I get into a self-driving car, um, the old uh, trite adage of the, the future is already here, it's just not equally distributed, is very much true. Um, there is very a f there there are a few places in the world that you can go to and already get a fully autonomous self-driving car uh, mm. self-driving trip mm. um, but the real technical challenges are in scaling up and so just to give you a couple of examples um, we often discover diminishing returns on some of the details for example uh, data labeling and data data collection and data labeling is, is very challenging and finding all the edge cases is really hard and this just takes time and um, often you discover that the labeling approach that you took have some problems with it. Uh, for example, an interesting switch that's happened in data labeling has been moving from uh, labeling on purely individual images to labeling on uh, short video clips. And labeling individual images is the approach that everybody took because that's the, the academically pioneered approach that's been very successful in computer vision it turns out that you then have many images that are very difficult to even tell what you're looking at. Once you switch to video, you have to rebuild the entire labeling pipeline, but this gives you much, much better labels. And these kind of discoveries that we keep making on like, where do we hit diminishing returns in some specific aspect, it, it takes time to figure that out. Um, another technical challenge is, is defining the requirements. So. Uh, before working on, on autonomous driving, I spent more time in the ADAS world and in automotive, we're very comfortable to very carefully write down the requirements and then verify that we meet those requirements. Um, the rules of the road are intractable and they're often contradictory. Uh, it turns out that even trying to write better rules of the road seems a little bit like a dead end. And how do you resolve this problem of you can't quite write the requirements as strict as we would like to from an engineering perspective, uh, but we still need to have very clear requirements against which we can verify our vehicle. And some people really lean towards a much more end-to-end -end learned approach here, but this is very, very, very complicated then from a safety perspective. How do you certify a system that truly is a single learned model from say camera images to driving commands? Um, that being said, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the approach we have will work. A lot of it, uh, I mean, as, as uh, Tyler remarked at the beginning, there's definitely has been all of the effects of the hype cycle in this world. Um, but to me, it's pretty clear that the approach to have robotic taxis in dense urban areas uh, like will work and is already working. The biggest challenge now is in how do you scale up and how do you collect the data? How do you understand the rules of the world, the rules of the road um, to be able to scale this technology? All right, thank you. Tyler, would you like to take next question? Or we'll ask next question. Yes, thank you for that. Um, it's been brought to my attention that my, my audio perhaps wasn't great earlier, so I hope it's better now. I'll try staying a little bit closer here, but please let me know. Um, my next question really is for, for all of our panelists, just because it is a, a question I've been thinking about for some time, and I just I love hearing people's opinion about this. You know, since we have an audience working in the navigation domain, um, I guess, how accurate do self-driving cars need to localize? And I'd like to start and uh, ask uh, Yoav, you know, what, what do you think about that? Okay, so obviously it really depends on the architecture uh, that the manufacturer choose, chooses. Um, if you're looking uh, at an architecture where you combine uh, localization techniques, uh, you know, HD mapping, which uh, is expensive uh, in terms of storage and compute power, in accurate GPS uh, using RTK or PPP or all of the technologies that we uh, uh, have today in the GNSS world that can uh, provide us with uh, extremely accurate positioning. Uh, it might not always uh, solve the problem that we're trying to solve uh, because we always run into the edge cases of tunnels, parking garages, and uh, looking at uh, autonomy uh, level five or 100% autonomous. 
uh, using only GPS will not solve this problem. So we, we all understand it has to be a combination. Uh, so if we don't trust or uh, require the GNSS to provide us with sentimental level accuracy uh, to keep us within the lane because that either with a, a LiDAR or, or a camera, um, we can use the GNSS uh, for a, a rough localization. Uh, a five meter accuracy will be enough, uh, which will allow us to uh, navigate, uh, to plot the route uh, to our destination, uh, use the directions that they, you know, uh, anticipate the oncoming turns. Uh, we don't need the extremely accurate uh, GNSS positioning. Uh, obviously, we do need extremely high localization techniques. Uh, to put us in the center of the lane, to avoid obstacles, uh, to allow us to enter and exit uh, the highway or uh, make turns accurately and not uh, drive on the sidewalk and not hit anything, driving to parking garages. Uh, uh, obviously, the lighting conditions, weather conditions uh, affect all of these kind of technologies. So it's a struggle and uh, we'll always have to uh, make compromise uh, and incorporate several technologies to provide us uh, with the localization required for a specific uh, scenario. Uh, Yo, thank, thank you for that perspective. Um, Niels, I would love to hear from you next. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Uh, and to, to add to what you have said, it, it does very much depend on the environment and depends on the, the entire approach to self-driving. Um, for us, we think about, and since we're very much interested in fully autonomous urban navigation, uh, we need to be able to localize to the accuracy of road markings at least. And to give you two examples of why this is, uh, to, to kind of motivate why this is the accuracy we localize to, um, uh, one is purely a safety consideration. Uh, crossing a lane line into an oncoming lane vastly increases your exposure to hazards uh, since entering the oncoming lane of course, now there are oncoming vehicles you have to deal with. And so we need to have a very clear understanding. And uh, since we frame that as a localization problem, we need to be able to localize ourselves accurately enough that we understand that. Um, we also want to be able to perform very nuanced lateral movements within a lane. Uh, an example of this, and this maybe draws back the curtain a little bit on some of the kind of technical challenges that comes up. Um, uh, we care about the experience of a passenger in our cars. Um, and when you, for example, as a, as a professional driver, when you pass a large truck on the freeway, you tend to lean a little bit to the right in the lane uh, and give a little bit more space to the truck if you've got nobody on the right and you've got a truck on your left. Or similarly, if, if there's construction happening on the right side of the right, you tend to perform some nuanced maneuvers to lean to the left of your lane. and so. In the end, really, we're looking at kind of sub 10 centimeter accuracies at your P99, your kind of three sigma level. Um, the, the relative versus absolute debate, um, I, I think in many ways is misplaced. Uh, we always localize to some reference frame. Uh, for us, that is the reference frame of our map. And now this enables all kinds of cool things. This lets you uh, see beyond sensor range, right? You know in quite some detail what's coming up. Uh, for example, getting into the correct lane to exit a highway. Long before you see the exit lane, you can already start working your way across because you understand at a lane level what the road network looks like. Um, some future looking things because we're localizing against this map is to share information between vehicles. Uh, one vehicle sees a new complex construction zone and can then uh, leave some information in the map for upcoming vehicles that uh, that will happen. Um, now, this sounds like a relative reference frame because I'm saying it's relative to some map. Uh, but as these technologies scale, our maps will scale. And quickly, you get to the point where if you want to map large swaths of the world, the only logical reference frame for a map is then the absolute reference frames that the GPS community is very familiar with, such as the ITRF 2014 reference frame. Um, so to me, uh, I think this is in some ways a red herring. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the long run, everybody is sitting in some kind of absolute reference frame against which our maps are updated. Um, I should also say that if people are interested, um, there's an excellent paper from our, uh, one of our moderators, Tyler, that has an excellent paper on the requirements for localization, which uh, generally I agree with. <laughs> 
Niels, thank you for the, the com thank you for the, the comments and for the kind words there. Um, Ashley, I'd love to hear your, your input. Definitely. Um, so I agree with what all the other panelists have said so far. Um, this is highly dependent on the architecture of your self-driving system and how you set it all up. Um, you know, if the perception stack is the main feature of your self-driving system, you could almost argue that humans only need lane level routing and localization and they use perception to solve the rest of the driving problem, um, visual perception in our case. Uh, so in that case, the localization requirements would just be half a meter, a meter, depending on the size of your vehicle and the average lane width that you're dealing with in your operational design domain. However, for the most part, most autonomous vehicles use the map for doing things like inferring traffic behavior, um, handling potentially occluded traffic participants based on the map geometry, um, and also planning at a higher resolution where you want the car to drive. Um, so in that case, we have very tight and stringent localization requirements that are on the level of 10 to 20 centimeters. Um, I also think that it's very important to talk about the velocity, acceleration, and orientation accuracy requirements when defining these requirements for localization. Um, obviously, position is very, very important and very, very challenging, but uh, if you're using your map to key in on where you want to look for a traffic light and you want to minimize your computational complexity of that, for example, then you might have a lot tighter restrictions on, well, if I want to see this particular traffic sign or traffic light at a distance of 200 meters and I only want this search space, you get a really strict heading uh, constraint there. And then also there's this really interesting interplay in between the localization system and the motion planning system. Um, so if you have a heading error on localization, but you think you're spot on in the center of the lane, um, your controller may try and compensate for that orientation. And depending on the lag in the system, you start getting lateral offsets in where you're actually driving within the lane due to heading errors. Um, and of course, you need the, the accurate velocity and acceleration feedback in order to execute your controller the way you want to as well. Um, so really interesting questions. Yeah, Ashley, thank you for that perspective. Um, my next question gets really more into the, the safety side and considerations and autonomy. And, and Niels, the first part of this question I'd like to ask to you, um, I think out there right now, there's a lot of debate as to what is the correct level of safety and autonomy. And I think there's been really quite the spectrum as to what, uh, you know, what has been proposed. And at least to my knowledge, that there's nothing that's definitively out there in the standards that say, hey, you know, the correct level of safety for autonomy for, you know, whether it be a level two or level four system is, is a certain number. And I think that there are arguments for, hey, you know, it should be a thousand times better than a human driver. And there are others who say, well, hey, if you're twice as good as a human driver, isn't that already doing better? And isn't that, that pretty good? Um, and there are others still who have said, well, perhaps you should target, you know, the targets that have been made in other industries, such as the civil aviation industry, for example, which I think a lot of folks uh, in this community are familiar with. And so, Niels, I'd love to hear your, uh, your view on, you know, what do you think is the right level uh, for autonomy? Sure, yeah, um, and that is, uh, that's a very, very difficult question to answer that uh, I also have not seen a definitive answer or have a definitive answer. Um, uh, if I had, I think everybody would have heard. <laughs> um, I'll, but I, I will reframe that question slightly. Um, the, do we need to be as good as a, as a human driver? Um, what is surprising to what was surprising to me starting to look at this is that uh, the vast majority of accidents from humans can be attributed to the three D's: drunk, drowsy, and distracted driving. And if we can remove those three, then we can be uh, we can so if if we could be at the level of a human driver uh, that is alert and pays attention. Um, and then we can remove those three failure cases, we would be on the order of two magnitudes, two orders of magnitude safer than a human driver. 
Um, of course, that's a very tall order to say, well, you need to kind of match uh, an alert human and just make sure they don't fall asleep. Um, but that is a, a nice, like a very high level challenge is to say in some environment, can you be like reasonably as safe as a, as a human operator? Um, there are also some things you have control over in autonomous driving that you don't have control over when you're doing, uh, when, when you're expecting human or like partial automation from a human driver. Um, and things like that is, uh, it might be acceptable to move slightly slower than uh, if the human driver is driving you. As a passenger, perhaps a 10% increase in trip time is acceptable uh, to be able to reach uh, several orders of magnitude higher safety than the equivalent uh, like human driven vehicle. Uh, and those, those are the kind of trade-offs that we're constantly trying to make. Um, in the end, the number that we care about is the probability of an accident per mile. And uh, the amount of accidents in the city that is coming from these very simple uh, drunk, distracted, drowsy, <laughs> um, you, uh, I, I do think that that's a reasonable estimate to, to make, to say, can we be several orders of magnitude safer than the equivalent human driver? And I think the answer is yes, because there's a surprisingly large amount of low hanging fruit we can get, uh, we can get a lot of mileage from. Niels, thank you for that. I guess because human drivers are occasionally so bad, it, it perhaps it's uh, not such a challenge uh, to, to try to match, it would be a little bit better, I suppose. <laughs> um, my follow up question is for Ashley. Um, I guess to your knowledge, you know, who, if anyone, is, is are setting these standards today or, or working towards them? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, and, you know, there are different safety standards for each different part of the system. There are safety standards for writing safe, reliable code. There are safety standards for vehicles. There are safety standards for transportation in general. Um, and we're still developing what the appropriate standards are for autonomous vehicles. And those standards are going to draw from each of these different areas um, in, in the ways that make the most sense. So I think that autonomous vehicle developers, that those companies are working on um, planning out which requirements make the most sense from these different industries. Um, and we're working together with the auto manufacturers at large and local and government authorities in order to hash this out and come to some sort of agreement. Um, you may have seen in the news recently that in Germany, there's a series of summits that Angela Merkel has been attending, uh, at least the first one, uh, and the major German auto manufacturers and also representatives from autonomous driving have been going there. Um, and, you know, of course, they're talking about lots of different factors to related to vehicles, but this also includes the future of autonomous driving and how those mobility providers are going to be integrated into the system. Um, so it's definitely a joint effort. Ashley, thank you for that. And my follow on question is for, for Yoav. Um, I'd like to hear, you know, from your perspective, you know, what standard bodies or industry industry groups should be involved in, in defining these kinds of, uh, this, this kind of elements of autonomous driving? Uh, okay, so obviously before I answer that, uh, I want to say that, that autonomous safety is paramount since the driver's responsibility obviously diminishes at the level of autonomy rises. Uh, and when we get to level five autonomy, basically there are no drivers. Uh, Cybersecurity is becoming a more paramount as autonomy level goes higher and becoming as important as physical safety devices like seat belts and airbags. So as for standard bodies, today cars rarely crash due to a malfunction or a failure of hardware. Most crashes, uh, as Niels pointed out, are due to human errors. So the same bodies that regulate automotive components should basically keep doing that and keep doing what they're doing. Uh, but they do need to adapt and add to the list of, of regulated components, components like uh, LIDARs, radars, cameras, uh, communication modules, and computing systems. Uh, and and on, obviously, all of the standards that go along with that uh, for writing safe codes for automotive level grade codes uh, go into that. Uh, obviously, the DMV, which currently oversees and regulates autonomous vehicle testing and development, will have to take more responsibility 
uh, along with regulatory bodies like uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and NHTSA. Uh, they and others need to transition and adapt for autonomous regulation, which is extremely different, uh, mainly due to the high responsibility placed on the OEMs. Uh, and, and they're saying basically, there is no driver, so you take all the blame. So it's really hard to uh, pinpoint who will be uh, the regulatory body that uh, will take all of the responsibility and could be a combination uh, of several bodies. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and then with that, uh, Dorota, I will turn the floor back to you. All right, thank you. So the Q&A box is getting full. So uh, let, me, let me actually combine two questions together. They are um, touching upon very similar points. So let me start um, fr from, from uh, number one, the type of autonomous navigation that I would personally very much appreciate, says one of our um, attendees, is that I navigate the car manually from the start point in the city to the next interstate. There is an autonomy, the autonomously driving me for a couple of hours towards my destination while I can relax and then I navigate from the exit through the city to my final destination. Isn't this much easier to implement than going autonomous all the way and couldn't it be rolled out much earlier? And another, um, another participant um, He's saying, Neil spoke about breaking up autonomous driving into modes like highway driving and congested cities. I like this approach. Do you see the rollout of autonomous driving capabilities happening in stages? Under this approach, in early years, the car would allow the driver to do autonomous driving on a highway, but would not permit this in a city. Over time, other modes would open up. What are your thoughts on this? And I think this is the question to, to all three of you. Who's going first? Um, I can start. Uh, I right. also was looking at these questions and I thought they were they were great. Um, yeah, those are those are two interesting questions that comes up a lot. And I actually want to make a very as clear as possible statement here because we think about this a lot. Um, Ninety eight percent of the lifetime of the average car is spent sitting in a parking lot. Uh, we see this as incredibly inefficient. And so the idea of uh, having your, like I, I completely agree with the sentiment in this. It is easier to do highway driving. It's a great value add. Uh, I think we already see this in many of the highway autopilots today that like, yes, it's spectacular to be able to get in uh, to today's modern Teslas and, and uh, many of the other cars that have autopilots. But from our perspective at Uber, this doesn't solve the global problem that we're trying to take on, which is to say we are producing two orders of magnitude more cars than we need. And it's more paramount than ever to not do that and to get uh, like a two, two orders of magnitude reduction in the amount of cars that's necessary to, to run our society. And so to do that, we need fully autonomous vehicles. Like that doesn't work if it's just you own a car as always and it's slightly better. Um, that works if you can say, you don't need to own cars anymore. Uh, I think that uh, at least for me in California, and for many of us in California, the, the wildfires this season and the last few seasons are extremely concerning. And so the, the climate implications of being able to just massively reduce the amount of cars needed is critical. Um, and so we, we have a, a North Star here that's very important to us. We agree that that's, that's a great product. We're just not in the business of doing that. And we don't think that that's really where the core, the core societal benefit will come from. And so, so how do you solve this? Uh, it's true that it's easier to do this. And um, if you look at a product that Uber has recently launched, you'll see a little bit of an insight in how we're thinking about this. And that product is uh, we now have multimodal trips uh, in our app. And what that means is you can say, I want to, I want to go from here to um, a good example. I like to use, I want to go from uh, San Francisco to Oakland, which is crossing the, the bay. And uh, through a single ride, a single ride experience, uh, you will take both a human driven Uber to your local uh, transportation hub, and then take a light rail that moves you to a transportation hub on the other side of the bay and then have an Uber waiting for you when you get out. 
And so you can imagine a similar rollout approach that um, we will see autonomous driving, uh, perhaps not fully solving the autonomous driving problem from the get go, but we can very rapidly move towards this world of beyond private car ownership through a model uh, where we have multimodal trips. I think um, uh, you are here that although it is simpler and we all agree that they're driving, navigating the highway is much simpler than navigating the city streets, uh, still we see Tesla crashes, uh, we see uh, Tesla drivers fall asleep uh, and for pure luck they actually wake up and not cause an accident. There are still many uncertainties, uh, especially if the highway is a little more con congested. Um, uh, maybe if it's a highway in Israel, which is not, uh, uh, the drivers around are not driving uh, as good as uh, European or American drivers. Uh, so it really depends on uh, uh, many other factors. And I still don't think uh, that I would feel comfortable falling asleep or even, even relaxing uh, in such an autonomous mode uh, with the technology we have today. Uh, and it has also been proven that uh, when something happens, and even if you're not asleep, uh, just not uh, focused on driving, you know, uh, listening to music, and suddenly the car uh, gives you the control back, you might cause more damage uh, because you're not really uh, fully aware of the situation. Um, so it is a problem, and I don't think uh, rolling out this feature alone will, uh, will bring us uh, closer to the autonomous future we, we're seeking. And then uh, Ashley here for maybe a final perspective on this answer. Um, I, I definitely agree that there are multiple different regimes in which autonomous driving would be useful. And uh, the approach for solving those problems does vary depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and in the Volkswagen group, we've actually broken up this problem into multiple different like specialized companies. So for the highway problem, there are projects in Audi doing the uh, highway pilot. Um, there are other groups that are focusing on how do you autonomously parallel park a vehicle. Um, as part of MAN, they're focusing on how do you do good shipment with large vehicles. Um, so it's easy to focus on the mobility on demand aspect of autonomous driving, because that's what we see most often in our day-to-day -day lives, but there's also uh, last mile goods delivery. There is highway transport for large vehicles. Uh, there's, there's highway pilots for small uh, personal vehicles. And I think that if we focus on each problem individually, that can help things progress quickly and we can do gradual rollouts and then ultimately try and tie everything together. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot of value added for long distance transport in public transportation means such as trains um, or mass public transport. Especially in Europe, that's more integrated into city infrastructure and whatnot. But there are some places where, you know, you take the, the metro or subway system and it doesn't go all the way out to where you want to go. So we can use autonomous driving in urban environments to do that last mile of people as well as goods. So I think all of these problems are important. Um, and if we, if we have different task force, courses that uh, focus on the different aspects, then we can make progress quickly. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me move on to the next question. And actually, there is a question in Q&A box for Tyler. Um, Tyler, um, you had mentioned a target safety of 10 to minus, minus 8 uh, per hour or one in a billion miles during your opening remarks. Can you elaborate on that and where it comes from? Yeah, certainly. I'd be happy to elaborate on that. And, and thank you for that question. So where that comes from is a combination of the, the current automotive standards. The, the gold standard really is you know, automotive safety integrity level D or ACLD, which does come with this specification of you know, 10 to the minus 8 probability of failure per hour. 
And so when you do the equivalencies to say, okay, those standards today really do apply to certain elements of electronic systems, not necessarily system level requirements. Uh, but there was some work that I was a part of to say, how might those current standards evolve to, you know, uh, you know specifications on, you know, some of these system level requirements that, that might come going forward. And so this, this 10 to the minus eight per hour number is really coming from current standards in the automotive industry and how they might evolve to adapt to, to these new situations. Um, I will mention that the, the number that, that Neil mentioned is a really interesting one about how uh, I believe it's something like 94% of crashes out there that are, are caused by human factors with these, these three Ds that were mentioned. Um, if you can eliminate those, it turns out you end up getting pretty close to an ACLD uh, level number of, uh, you know, of performance in terms of you know, the other systems in the vehicle in terms of their contribution in this side of things. Uh, but, but Carl, thank you for that question. And I, I do have a reference I'll point you to and I'll, 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 I'll post it in the chat uh, here if, if you're interested. All right, thank you very much, Taylor. I will just ask one, one question um, and then turn over to Taylor in a second. This question is for Niels and Ashley, but you are, please uh, feel free to add to it as well. Um, the question is, what are the predominant architectures for autonomous vehicle localization, which have emerged in the industry? If you can um, discuss pros and cons and what is the path forward? Who wants to go first? Ashley, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's there's a whole spectrum of what you can use for localization in autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think that ultimately the systems that rely on a, a, a multitude of different sensor modalities are going to be the, the most robust. Uh, but in general, if you are trying to drive on a highway, and you have um, some assumptions about the GNSS availability, perhaps using a high accuracy RTK device could be sufficient in applications like that. But in general, we try and, and augment these localization methods with other sensors such as LIDAR and camera and radar, um, possibly ultrasound as well. Um, and when you get into these types of sensors, you have the option to use them for relative pose estimates between different timestamps. So if you have one image uh, and then a few seconds later another image or milliseconds, uh, you can do visual, od visual odometry to try and gauge your distance traveled. Um, possibly also if you have a map, you can use the camera image to do registration with your map and get a map relative pose estimate as well. Um, and similar for LIDAR. So then the next question from that is, are you going to use a, a dense registration method or are you going to use a sparse set of features? So um, if you use dense methods such as ICP between point clouds, dense camera image features, um, you have a lot of data volume that you're processing, but you can be very confident in your results. Um, however, if you are using a, a full LiDAR sweep um, and doing a, a dense method registration, ICP or something similar, um, you might not necessarily be as robust to occlusions in your sensor. Um, so for dense methods, you have large data storage volumes, computationally intensive algorithms, but you have confidence for the most part when you have a good sensor field of view. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you wanna use similar sensors, but a more lightweight approach, you can extract interesting features from the environment or landmarks um, and therefore have a very sparse set of uh, representations of your environment. Uh, there have been some papers published that are talking about using pole-like objects such as lampposts or trees as something that's easy to detect and localize accurately uh, to get a relative position estimate. And then you can use constellations of these features uh, to register with your map um, to figure out where you are. And those tend to be more robust to occlusions and are a little bit more lightweight. Um, so ultimately the design decision here is how much data storage can you handle? Um, what does the map update process look like? 
as the environment changes. If you have very dense points, how do you gauge which of those points need to be updated with changes in the environment or not? Um, if there is a change in the environment, are you going to send out a map update to your entire fleet immediately over the air? And uh, can your communication systems handle that sort of data volume transfer? Um, or do you need the, the vehicle to return to a depot to get an update? Um, how much change can you tolerate before the system fails? Um, and these are all the kind of different design decisions that you have to make when you're selecting a localization approach. So ultimately, um, everybody has to go through this, this trade-off and come up with a decision. And uh, as with most trade-offs, I think taking an approach that, that blends the best of both worlds is ultimately the path forward. Great, yeah, I, um, I agree with, with all of that. Um, I think that uh, everybody relies on a fused approach. I, I would be surprised if anybody truly has, you know, a one sensor approach that, that solves this problem. Um, in my view, there's predominantly two architectures. Uh, there's an approach where local range sensors fused with inertial sensors can place the vehicle in a map. This is the kind of LIDAR mapping approach and also some like vision or radar or other and more esoteric approaches um, really work. And uh, what's nice about this is that it, it breaks down the driving problem very cleanly. It kind of speaks to the abstraction that I mentioned earlier that like because you're placed in a map and very accurately in that map, you the static driving problem is fairly well solved. And so um, and, and what's furthermore is because you have an approach where you localize very accurately using uh, local range sensors, you have a very clean abstraction between your localization and local perception system and then the planning that you do on this map. Um, of course, some of the cons here is that, that you need a map. And Ashley spoke to some of the challenges of having that to you. Um, updating a map is uh, tricky and complex. The data volume is very large. Um, you also need, you know, local range sensors that work well, and LiDAR is still fairly expensive, although uh, big breakthroughs has been made there. Um, one, one kind of interesting approach here is you can use multiple disjoint sensors for accuracy. And so uh, I think GNSS can play a role in this as a, a way to increase your reliability. Um, we, we, I think, generally the engineering approach of having redundant sensors and playing those off against each other is an approach we can take here to use GNSS as something, especially with, with very precision GNSS coming on board to monitor LiDAR systems. Um, the second predominant architecture is much more of a split approach where you can use uh, local perception sensors like cameras to do very local positioning, for example, laterally positioning a vehicle in the lane and then uh, having GNSS and lower precision, although it's still high precision GNSS, uh, place you, of course, the on a map. So you can do lane level planning and lane level maneuvers all based on GNSS on a lane level map, and then use vision to do your in lane planning. Um, this is the approach that's, again, more favored by highway autopilots. And what's really nice here is that you can, you can plan a lot of your local maneuvers just very directly against your computer vision. Um, this is also an example of where something like uh, many highway autopilots can improve. Uh, currently, there's a lane level planning that happens, and then there's a lane centering algorithm that's running. And that, uh, that split often creates for some uncomfortable feelings. Um, I like the example of passing large trucks on the freeway or construction cones, where uh, you actually want to do some in-lane planning separate from your lane level planning. Um, this is this algorithm, sorry, this, this hierarchy uh, this hierarchical approach where you do lane level planning and then in lane planning is a, a place where GNSS and high precision GNSS really shines because being able to get to that lane level with a very, very high safety guarantee is something that I think GNSS is a fantastic sensor to do. Um, I think it's worth also noting a little bit on kind of where this might be going and like the future directions here. Um, Personally, I, I really love the complementary nature of LIDAR and GNSS. 
uh, if you imagine the, the best possible environment for high precision GNSS, I'd say it probably looks like um, a receiver uh, far away from the ground plane in the middle of a large flat open area uh, with no obstructions close by. Um, this best case for GNSS is exactly LIDAR's worst case. Any kind of local range sensor absolutely fails in this environment because there's just no geometry, there's no texture to localize from. On the other hand, in a very complex environment full of local geometry, this is fantastic for local range sensors, uh, but GNSS struggles. And so I, I really like that complementary nature of the two sensors. Um, one direction, and, and Ashley remarked on the, the computational and data management challenges, I think this is a future direction, especially in the ADAS world. Um, we have, uh, and, and I, I'd say generally today's autonomous vehicle architectures have about five orders of magnitude more compute, compute power than today's ADAS architectures. Um, I haven't worked in ADAS in two years, so that number might have changed, but at least the last time I was doing any ADAS work, it was, it was about five orders of magnitude computation difference. And uh, for us, we deploy a lot of that extra compute to be able to do localization based on range, range sensors. Um, I'd be very curious to see what happens as uh, we scale up the compute capabilities on the ADAS side. This is a place where um, it's relatively inexpensive to scale the onboard compute. And uh, I'd be curious, especially for the GPS community, almost to, to challenge you and say, um, if we could provide you know, three to five orders of magnitude more computation, uh, what, what can you do? Uh, thank you. Jörg, would you like to add any comments? Yes, I can come. Me coming from the GNSS world, uh, I, I'm a big advocate of using GNSS, uh, not necessarily uh, for high accuracy, uh, but for general localization. I uh, like to think of the GNSS as the only predictive, as we say, predictive sensor, uh, because you have a map uh, and you can position yourself on the map and uh, foresee uh, uh, what is coming along the way, if it's a roundabout, an exit, uh, uh, an intersection. Uh, so it is uh, an important sensor, sensor in the health sensor fusion system. Uh, but having said that, uh, I also uh, think of all of the edge cases where it wouldn't work. Um, again, tunnels, uh, parking garages, and all of those uh, uh, areas that we do need to have uh, alternative technology. And if we do develop that technology uh, in, in a way that is good enough uh, to work without GNSS, and the question is, can we use that technology without GNSS basically anywhere? And, and, and I'm still contemplating with myself uh, what, what is the best answer for that. All right, thank you. Um, so I think it's fair to say we have heard quite a bit today from all three of you. Um, how important are the maps, GNSS and LiDAR and other sensors just to increase the redundancy to make sure that we have reliability of positioning. Um, so I'd like to follow with a little bit challenging question. Uh, some of the preeminent voices read Elon Musk in the self-driving car industry have publicly stated that HD maps, precision GNSS and LiDAR are not part of the solution of the self-driving car problem. Can you comment please? Ashley, you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, I think that we have covered this a little bit so far. Um, ultimately, if you want a safe system, you need sensor redundancy. One sensor is not going to cut it by itself. Um, if you think about cameras, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of benefits. Uh, they can pick up a lot of interesting detail in the environment. However, uh, they're very dependent on lighting conditions, weather conditions, um, and yeah. So I think ultimately you need sensors that are gonna have complementary failure modes. Uh, so LiDAR is great. Uh, it provides range information. Maybe it has similar failure modes in terms of weather conditions. 
uh, to cameras, but it is not necessarily affected by glare from the setting sun or can't um, always be tricked in the same ways. Um, and as Neil said, GNSS is also a completely independent uh, failure mode. It struggles in different regions than cameras and uh, LIDAR systems. And, you know, also there's, there's radar, uh, which is weather independent for the most part. Maybe it's not as high resolution as some of these other sensors, but it's a great fallback mode um, to really detect when you're having issues. Um, and maybe one thing that we haven't necessarily stressed very much yet in this conversation is that sometimes it's okay if you can't handle every situation, but it's very, very important that you can identify when you've come to a situation that you don't know how to handle. So you can notify either the safety driver, remote operations, or take a, a maneuver to go to a safe, stable state somehow, whatever that looks like, depending on the situation. Um, yeah, and if you only have one sensor type, that's really, really challenging to identify. All right, thank you. Um, Neil, so you're up. Anything to add? Uh, Elon is coming. Any, any, any advice to Elon Musk you can actually include, yeah, please? Is, uh, basically uh, saying, okay, me as a human, I don't have a, a LiDAR in my, my, in my, my brain. Uh, and not a GPS. I do have my eyes, and if I'm capable of using my eyes uh, to drive a car, why a computer wouldn't be able to do that? And I tend to agree with most of it. Uh, the challenge here is to actually make uh, the camera uh, robust and reliable enough in all weather conditions, in all lighting conditions, uh, and obviously the algorithms, uh, all of the AI and the image recognition still need to improve, uh, but I think Elon uh, has done a pretty good job and has demonstrated that he can use uh, only these uh, two technologies, uh, using a camera for uh, navigating uh, and, and maintaining the lane and uh, radar uh, for collision avoidance. Uh, they don't use uh, GNSS for precision uh, localization, but they do need the GNSS uh, to plan the route and uh, to know which is the exit should be taken. Uh, so uh, I tend to agree with his approach. Niels? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, and to, uh, if, to add to what you was saying, the, uh, you know, the argument goes something like, you know, humans do it with two eyes, so our car should do it with two cameras. Um, I'd say generally in the last um, several centuries, we've been very successful in building a computation stack that's built on the electrical properties of silicon rather than organic chemistry. And generally we've had quite different solutions since it's been kind of like an interesting, surprising fact of the universe. Um, I would say, I think, I think the statement, uh, I think he made that statement like very early 2019, like about a year and a half ago. Um, I think that statement actually belies the speed of the work because uh, it's true that Elon has made that statement. They've also ramped up their use of precision GNSS and mapping since then. So I think there's contradictions even on their side there. Um, I also think we've seen a lot of unfortunate examples where a lack of maps caused a terrible failure most. There's the, the famous Tesla accident on Highway 101, just about 40 miles south of here where a perception system mistook the space between two lanes as a lane and uh, plowed a vehicle directly into a concrete barrier at speed where a lane level map would trivially have solved this problem. Um, I think it's very difficult to predict long term, like will, is, is the computation stack and is the approach that we will see 100 or 200 years from now um, something that just looks like cameras. I think that there's a general feeling that if you push the timeline out long enough, then yeah, perhaps, because we have this example of, of humans doing this with just their eyes. Um, in the more kind of near term, something that we actually have examples of what this works like, I think that, I think that Elon is very good at making statements that are shocking to the world. And I think this is more of an example of that than something that's really rooted in, in reality. 
and if anything, I think they've contradicted it already. And um, and yeah, I, I fully expect maps and mapping and GNSS and accurate localization to play a critical part in the stack for uh, many decades. Well, thank you. So perhaps we should invite um, Elon to the next IOM meeting when we continue with those panels. All right, um, Tyler, over to you. Yes, Dorota, thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a question from our, from our audience, and I think this starts getting into the, the ethics surrounding autonomy. And it's a question I think that comes up quite often. And so uh, thank you, Christopher Baker, for this question. And the question is, and, and really I address this to all of our panelists, that is, you know, will the uptake of fully autonomous movement around urban environments be hindered by issues around the trolley problem? i.e. a situation where a vehicle will crash but has to decide what to crash into? And will software programmers be happy with taking responsibility for decisions which might end up killing innocent people? And I think that one of the one of the classic examples that's used there is if you know you have a, an elderly person crossing the road and a, you know someone with a baby carriage, who do you choose? And and or or is that even the right question to ask? And so, yeah, I'd love to hear from our from our panelists. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, uh, he, I was wondering whether somebody was going to bring up the trolley problem, and here it is. Um, uh, the trolley, so I'm going to make a, a personal statement. I personally feel like the trolley problem is a little bit of a red herring. Um, the, the trolley problem depends on two important factors. It, it depends on having inadequate time to make a decision. Um, and, it, and, it, and it ends, and, and it depends on having like inadequate resources. Uh, now, that's not to say that no trolley problem ever comes up, but you can make significant progress and bound the probability of something like a trolley problem coming up by eroding these two fundamental assumptions. So um, the inadequate time to make a decision is something that we can erode significantly through very, very good sensors. Like we have superhuman sensing on the cars. Our, our cars have sensing capabilities that, that I wish that I had as a, as a human. It would be like qu quite fun in some ways to have that level of, of sensing. And you can bound that further doing things like sensor sharing and say, well, actually I understand my environment very, very well. And so uh, I can bound the probability of, of getting into this situation in the, in the first place. Um, we also understand the probability of these occurrences. So uh, by understanding the world and the occurrence, and, and uh, for example, just understanding the likelihood of where you get into occurrences where a vehicle can come out of occlusion. Uh, you try to drive occlusion down to have as little of that as possible through smart sensing. And then you understand where occlusion still occurs and understand the risks. So uh, I think this is a little bit of a red herring um, because we can protect ourselves against getting into the situation, except in very, very, very rare occurrences. Um, I, I would also kind of directly respond to the, the framing of this saying, like, will software engineers be you know, happy to take this responsibility? Um, at least the way that our organizations are structured. In the end, this is not something that lies with the software engineering organization. In the end, this is something that, that lies with uh, these organizations as a whole. And so this is where I was remarking on how we have external safety certification boards. We have significant and very close collaboration with regulatory bodies. This is not something that we want to make uh, purely on an engineering side. This is really like a societal discussion that's happening uh, at a governmental level, at a legal level. Um, and even if, you, even if you move beyond the trolley problem, just how do you think about the liabilities of robots that's suddenly moving around uh, the public space? And this is something that, that we are very, very much solving collaboratively. I think that's a great answer, Niels. Thank you for that. Um, Ashley or Yoav, did you have anything to add? I think mainly uh, if you uh, literally look at uh, an elderly person and uh, a mother with a baby carriage, uh, assuming the computer has enough time to actually understand it's an old person and a baby, uh, I'm sure we all agree uh, what would me, uh, we as, as the uh, human driver would prefer to eat. 
but I don't think uh, uh, putting that burden on the software developers to decide, uh, let's write an algorithm that will identify that this person is 80 years old and this is a baby and okay, let's kill the, the older person. Uh, I don't think it's uh, ethical to give that responsibility to the software programmers. Uh, it should basically be a, a question of uh, what is easier uh, uh, for the car to avoid. And if both are unavoidable, uh, I'm sure an algorithm can score uh, which can, uh, what, what is the probability of hitting uh, that specific target in a less severe way, I would say, and focus on that instead of uh, asking, uh, is the life of uh, an elderly worth less or more than the life of a baby? I think that uh, the other panelists have covered this question uh, really well in terms of the autonomous driving side of things. And I just wanna add um, from the philosophical side of things, I think there's a lot of really interesting research going into this question. Um, I know there's a lab at MIT that's been studying this and asking these questions. And then also in 2018, um, I forget the organization that ran this study, but there was an international group that um, pulled people from many different countries asking um, questions about the trolley problem with this group versus this group, this group versus this group. Um, and it turns out that there were a lot of very common trends in ethical decisions between Western societies, uh, but then some of the Eastern societies, they had very extreme answers uh, on most of these evaluation axes compared to uh, some of the other societies. They, they were all pretty much in the middle, um, which kind of indicates that if we're talking ethics with autonomy, even designing the right questions is really challenging and culturally dependent. Um, and so, you know, if you if you want to think about these sorts of things, I think it's a very broad area of active research and there, I think we're still working on asking the right questions in the first place here. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. And I, I think this leads well into our, our, our next uh, discussion point, which is can we really ever rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning for to, to make some of these decisions for us? Because perhaps it won't be something so so cut and dry. You know, if, if this happens, do this. I think it, a lot of it is in, in the weeds on, on some of these algorithms that are being developed and, and in the training data. And so do you think we can really rely on these things? And, and Niels, I might look to you for a first response. Sure, yeah. Um... And yeah, I've touched on this a little bit before, it's worth drilling into this. Uh, like it's a common misconception to think that like AI has to be better than human strengths to really solve this problem or to really be like reliable or be able to solve critical situations. Uh, it, it doesn't, it just needs to beat human weaknesses. And this is still very difficult, but it's much more within reach. Uh, if you remove the, the distracted, drunk and drowsy component of humans, then our AI systems are already much more reliable in critical situations based on this. Um, the real trade-off here is the challenge of being, of, of how much you wanna bounce safety versus your ability to make progress. So like we have that ability to, to kind of turn knobs to say, um, we, we need to make progress. And so how do we make our way through a complex city uh, while at the same time we wanna be as safe as possible. And so for, for us, the answer is, you turn the safety knob up as much as possible. And then in critical situations, because you're being cautious, uh, you can see them ahead of time. And so trade off progress and say, well, maybe we just, we'll just make progress slower and that's acceptable. Um, I think another, another misconception is that uh, neural networks will somehow be uncertifiable for safety critical systems. Um, this, this is false. Uh, neural networks are massively complex and they're definitely a, a challenge but fundamentally they, they are still interpolating between known samples. So what, what you want is you want everything that a vehicle encounters to be within the convex hull of known scenarios. Now this is not trivial, um, but we have, one, once you think about it like that, then the problem becomes quite a bit easier. So for example, um, a, a challenge in this world that I think everybody's familiar with is the challenge of how do you just find the occurrences of very rare elements 
uh, also known as kind of the long tail problem, or do you have this long tail of scenarios? And, and you can make progress on this in a couple ways. That's actually very powerful. Recently, kind of in the research world, there's been very promising ideas around using synthetic data. So you don't have to go and find every example of everything in the real world. Um, and you especially don't have to collect like massive training sets for every possible scenario. You can generate a lot of this data ahead of time, um, or you can increase coverage of your data sets by finding those like one example of a very rare event and then synthetically boosting it. Um, another approach is to re is to to reason about the geometry of these problems. Um, if you really think about it as like kind of pixels in driving commands out, then this is uh, then it, it seems quite challenging in how we would build a reliable system. But if you break down the problem more into its geometric components, then you can make much more progress. Um, so I, I think I think that yes, absolutely, we can re like rely on artificial systems in critical situations, and then we will be able to solve the certification problem. Um, and, and, and in many ways, this comes back to where localization and mapping really helps. Starting from a completely unknown environment, this this is quite challenging. But if you can localize a vehicle on a map, you understand the static environment, and you can only look at the anomalies, what the dynamic actors are doing, what changes to the static environment. Um, you can do significantly better here. And combining that with uh, advances and using some synth synthetic data, understanding the geometry of your environment and how the pixels that you perceive uh, map to that geometry, uh, I think, yes, absolutely. And uh, we already have systems. Um, I'll, I'll, since we were talking about Elon Musk, um, the Tesla autopilot system has already been shown to be orders uh, close to an order of magnitude less accidents per mile. And so I think it's important to really think about the problem like that. Like we want to reduce the accidents per mile and we're doing that. Niels, thank you. Um, Yoab or Ashley, anything to add? Nothing. All right. Well, I think that's a good cue for us to take a, a short break. Um, so we'll target something like a 10 minute break. So if we could, maybe I think probably the easiest thing is to target just being back at uh, half past the hour for whatever uh, time zone you're in. And uh, yeah, we'll be back shortly. Thank you so much.
All right, um, it's exactly 11.30 in Columbus, Ohio. I'm sure there is a different time everywhere else, but at least it's half, half an hour, half into the hour. So welcome back. Um, sorry we were not able to serve tea, coffee, and cookies. I'm, I'm hoping that everyone has them handy. Um, so let's get back to our questions. The Q&A box is getting full, and I'm going to start um, from the top what I see in those questions. So. Um, all right, um, this is from Thomas Pani. Um, Thomas is asking, since autonomous driving on highway have been, have already been discussed, can you iterate on that regarding driving on highways during the night? What are the fundamental challenges there? Who will take it first? Um, I'm happy to, to comment. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, there's, I'd say, two fundamental challenges. Um, one, as I think you're alluding to, illumination is different. And so for any of our passive uh, sensors that depend on uh, sunlight, like cameras, um, this is a more challenging environment. Uh, there's some approaches to help with this. Uh, one is looking to thermal cameras, which can help solve this. Um, also, generally, uh, this is a less of a problem than uh, I think people think it might be. Um, occlusions and anything that occludes cameras is a real problem. And so things like you know very bad snow or, or heavy rain is more challenging than nighttime driving. Um, the other aspect that's interesting is that uh, other actors behave differently at night, especially in the city. And so a lot of the models that we build around how people and other cars behave, we have to expand those. So um, I think it's more of a, a scaling problem than kind of a fundamental challenge. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, I've got one. So I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, actor behavior changing at night. Uh, one of the things we also have to account for is that the rules of the road change depending on time of day. Um, so that's something we need to build into our systems. You know, sometimes depending on what hour it is, carpool lanes are open for everyone or they're more or less restricted. Um, also at nighttime in Germany, often a lot of the traffic lights turn off and they become four-way stops instead of uh, regulated intersections. Um, sometimes you're allowed to turn left at special intersections in the US, uh, but not during rush hour. Um, so these different time-based constraints are something we need to incorporate into our AV systems, usually through the map. Um, yeah, so there's the sensor aspect, as Niels mentioned, but there's also the the mapping and and keeping track of the rules of the road aspect as well. Thank you. Joaf, any comments? Well, maybe just a little comment about the, the camera themselves. Uh, us as humans uh, tend to uh, cope with bad lighting or uh, sudden uh, high beams and uh, you know uh, sunlight hitting our eyes. We have a uh, means uh, like mechanical means, our hands or uh, um, other stuff that you can put in front of our eyes just to block uh, for momentarily uh, the, what is causing the, the camera or our eyes to not see as well as it did. And maybe it's a good idea to think in that direction. Uh, I'm not saying build a mechanical uh, hand to, <laughs> to block a high beam uh, for a couple of seconds, but maybe inside the cameras think of uh, uh, some kind of uh, a way to cope with these kind of uh, fast changing uh, situations. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to um, to the next question. This next question is actually for um, for Ashley, uh, but again, um, everyone is welcome to um, to chip in. The question is: What are some international and regional differences 
when considering what driver behaviors we deem as safe, and I think you already commented does this a little bit. Are there any challenges in achieving seamless context switching between different safety regulations across borders? So this is something we think about a lot at Argo. Uh, so Argo does drive in multiple different cities across the US. Um, we operate in Miami, DC, Palo Alto, Pittsburgh, etc. Um, so as you can imagine, there are, there are huge driving style differences between all these different cities, uh, not to mention the differences across countries uh, when we start driving in Germany. One of the things that I found interesting when I first moved here um, and was working at a company that was just focused on Germany specifically at that point in time is that uh, over here, people tend to follow the rules of the road uh, and follow them pretty precisely. Uh, so you only pass someone on the left. Uh, you adhere to stopping and waiting at intersections. You don't do a California stop and roll through an intersection. Um, you don't really violate the speed limit that much either. Whereas in some places in the US, people drive exactly the speed limit. In some places in the US, people drive 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, so all of these different things you really have to account for in your perception and your prediction systems. Um, one of the things we try to do with our autonomous vehicles is we do have to follow the rules of the road, uh, probably more strictly than, than a human driver might be tempted to follow them. Um, but at the same time, we need our behaviors to blend in with the traffic participants around us. Um, so there are two different approaches you can take to this problem. You can tune your driving behavior based on your location, uh, or you can try and tune your behavior to something that blends in with all other traffic participants, but that's, that's a little bit challenging to quantify. Um, so yeah, it's something that we do have to think about and adds a little extra flavor to the challenge of autonomous driving. Niels, you're up. Uh -uh. Yeah, I can shortly add to that as well. I agree with everything Ashley was saying. And it's interesting to note that those regional differences, it's, they're, they're very apparent international, but to add to what Ashley was alluding to, um, those differences go all the way down to even like neighborhood based differences where in different parts of San Francisco, you see quite su surprisingly different driving behavior, um, which, which is pretty interesting. And it is, it, it does make scaling a challenge, which I think is, I've been kind of hammering this scaling thing to death, um, like scaling is a real challenge for this. You are? All right, uh, let me just uh, move on to the next question. And this is to the entire panel from Dean Davies. Um, do you think computer learning will evolve sufficiently to be able to handle enough of the edge cases to make urban driving practical and safe enough for regulations or will urban autonomy really require the emergence of general AI that can make intuitive decisions like human drivers do? Who can take on that one? That's a very complicated uh, question, the way I see it. Uh, urban driving, uh, like I said before, and uh, everybody has basically said the same, uh, is very different. And most of the driving is, is uh, basically edge cases. Uh, every edge case is not uh, identical to the edge cases we've experienced before. Every time it's a little different. Uh, I do tend to believe that AI will be able to cope with those small differences. This is exactly what AI is good at. Um, it's not like a piano is falling out of the sky and, uh, and a cannonball. It, it's not like they're not very different. Uh, we are driving in a lane and uh, although each edge case is different, they do have a common denominator between them and we can group these kind of uh, edge cases and allow AI to uh, cope with them. Yeah, I'll, I'll also remark on this. Um, no, I, I don't believe that we need general AI to solve self-driving. Um, if, if that was the case, I would 
uh, be pretty un, pretty demotivated because I don't think that we have any approach to solve general AI yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the approaches that we have are quite promising. They're, uh, once we get to general AI, uh, if we get there, that would be lovely because then the self-driving car problem would be incredibly simple. But you do not need the level of creative problem solving or dealing with like truly unknown environments, being able to, to extrapolate and transfer learning from known situations to brand new situations that uh, the general intelligence provides. You, you don't really need that. Um, you definitely need incredibly, incredibly good perception systems, incredibly, incredibly good, uh, like kind of the kind of AI systems that we have. But to me, it's, it's pretty promising that the current approaches will work. We don't need to go to a full general AI system. All right. Well, you have something to add, Ashley? I, yeah, I do. So um, handling edge cases is something I think about on a, a regular basis in my day to day job. Um, so there are a lot of strange things that can happen in the world that are, are hard to predict. Um, you know, vehicles driving around with uh, advertisements on them that can confuse camera based perception systems. Um, people walking around in chicken suits, are you going to identify them as a person or not? Um, and you know, the edge cases of, hey, a, a leaf gets stuck on your LiDAR sensor or a bird pooped on one of your stereo cameras. Um, and you know, there are, there's a whole range of scenarios that can happen to affect your autonomous driving system. Um, but what it really comes down to is thinking through what's the actual failure mode behind your different sensors for each of these different components and breaking it down into a detailed failure mode and effect analysis and trying to trigger all of those different failure modes in different ways in your test setup. But ultimately, um, if the LiDAR is blocked, you might see similar impacts on your localization system, for example, if you have a truck that's like parked next to you on the roadway and blocking your field of view as you would if you have a leaf on your LiDAR sensor. Maybe if you want to fix it, uh, the fix is different. But if you can design your system to be robust to a field of view outage, um, then you don't need to account for every single uh, possible scenario that could lead up to part of your field of view being blocked, for example. Um, so part of our job as VNV engineers is to think through what could cause problems. What does that actually look like in terms of the sensor data? Okay, let's try and trigger all of those in testing that we can, um, and then monitor our fleet data and drive as much as possible to try and identify when there are cases that we haven't thought of yet, but really trying to be really thorough in uh, triggering all of the modalities even if we can't get every single root cause. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Tyler, over to you. And Dorota, thank you. Um, so my next question is uh, for Yoav, and this is really getting into the elements of cybersecurity and autonomy. And I think that often today in the design of, you know, uh, just you know, in the automotive industry by and large, I think, uh, cybersecurity and safety are often treated as two separate problems and are considered separately in the design of a vehicle. And you know, I'd love to hear your view on whether you think that should continue to be the case. Okay, thanks for the question, uh, Tyler. So we've all heard of uh, cases where a cybersecurity loophole uh, caused physical harm in many different industries. And uh, autonomous vehicles obviously are not different. Uh, a security hole uh, can cause uh, physical harm. Uh, at Regulus, uh, we've uh, demonstrated that on a, a Tesla last year. Uh, we can cause a Tesla simply by uh, spooking the GPS uh, to uh, cross the lane into oncoming traffic. Um, we presented that uh, in, in several uh, opportunities. So the new components that are being added uh, to autonomous vehicles all include very sophisticated computing systems. They all run different operating systems. Uh, in different maturity levels. And obviously they contain potential security uh, holes ready uh, or waiting to be exploited by hackers. Uh, so add to that the different uh, sensors that are used. It is susceptible to external attacks like the GPS spoofing or camera blinding, uh, image manipulation, 
uh, ladder spoofing, we've seen, we, we've seen that as well. And we have to treat these threats as serious uh, safety issues, just like the reliability of the braking system or our tires uh, or the steering system. So we do need to delegate the responsibility to the tier ones and tier twos, uh, uh, tier two providers. The OEMs must ensure uh, that all of the components comply and uh, the interaction between the components do not add any uh, additional security holes. And I think it's the, uh, the place to remind uh, or, or to uh, uh, tell you about the Israeli startup community uh, or startup companies that are dealing with the, such uh, security issues, uh, especially in the automotive industry. Uh, each has its own different approach, uh, but it does uh, shed light on the problem. And uh, we all agree, at least here in Israel, and I'm sure that the, the industry uh, also agrees, that cybersecurity is a, a, a very big risk and should be treated uh, as a safety uh, a critical risk. Yeah, well, thank you for that response. And I guess, um, Ashley or Neil, do you have anything to add from the, the cybersecurity element and how that becomes part of the safety equation? No, nothing, nothing on that front. All right. Well, I'd like to go to some, take some more questions from our audience. And uh, the first question is, and thank you to Andre for this question. For urban navigation, you know, is it reasonable to assume that putting all intelligence and processing you know, only into the vehicles will lead to success in the near future? Uh, or will cities have to set up supporting infrastructure you know, as part of this? And I think this is a, a great question. And I think this was a trade that certainly I spent a lot of time on. You know, do you invest in infrastructure or you know, do you invest in you know, making those vehicles you know, all powerful? And uh, yeah, I'd love to open this to our panel. So uh, who'd like to go first? <laughs> Uh, I don't mind chiming in here. Uh, so, you know, I think that there are a variety of different approaches um, and either, you know, that could be taken. However, when we're thinking about um, installing infrastructure in the urban environment and doing um, infrastructure to vehicle communication or vehicle to vehicle communication, we do have to think about the cybersecurity risk there. Um, so if everything is on the vehicle, you can have an isolated system that depends on itself and you can uh, take your own actions in your design to account for different failure modes you might see. Um, and so by opening it up and uh, looking for more like over the air linkages, then you have to start thinking about can somebody hack that signal? Can somebody spoof that signal? Um, so kind of tying back to the previous question there. Yeah, I, I love this question because this is something in a, in a previous role I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, with uh, Before I was at Uber, I was at Swift Navigation, which is a company that specializes in GPS. Um, there's I'm going to break this down into two components. There's a, a passive infrastructure, so examples like uh, lanes that are specific for autonomous cars. Um, this kind of work, uh, I think, is quite valuable. And it, it's very similar to what we do with highways today. Uh, freeways are already access controlled infrastructure that we spend billions of dollars on that's like hugely beneficial even without autonomy. Uh, carpool lanes, it's fully passive infrastructure that helps with traffic flow. And so the idea of like, well, maybe we should have autonomous car lanes. I think that that's actually quite a powerful idea um, and, and will help us speed up the adoption of a lot of this work. Um, an area that, uh, in the opening slide, Tyler had a great example of passive infrastructure, um, specialized pick up and drop off zones. This is great. This, this does make the autonomy problem easier. You say, well, I know exactly where I can drop off people and there's some restrictions and uh, this, this helps a lot. Um, active infrastructure, which a lot of people are excited about, the kind of 5G based sensor sharing and the like. Um, my stance on that is that it is purely augmentative. It'll, it'll help us, but it's quite difficult to, at this point, make an argument that that should be part of kind of the safety critical core. Um, the biggest challenge is, uh, once again, you have outages. And we have to deal with that in general. I mean, we have ways to deal with kind of faulty sensors, as is actually has already remarked on. Um, 
But I think I, I, I do not believe that this is strictly necessary. I think the passive infrastructure approach is actually quite, quite interesting and quite powerful and is already happening. Some of that will, will undoubtedly happen to help speed up this, this adoption. Um, I have not seen a compelling example of the active infrastructure that truly speeding things up. What I think is pretty promising is the, a lot of the sensor sharing ideas that will come over time that will help with further driving safety, further driving uh, performance of our vehicles to be able to, for example, have um, monitoring of pedestrians as they cross intersections. Uh, but fundamentally, we still have to deal with the fact that you have to predict what that pedestrian will do and be specifically cautious about them. And so it'll help with things like the detection challenges. And it'll reduce occlusion, which helps a lot, but uh, it doesn't solve the problem for us. And so, and, and since you have outages, you still need to be able to perform uh, safely, perhaps slightly lower performance, a little bit degraded performance, but very much you want to be safe with just what's on the vehicle. Thank you for that, Niels. Uh, Joaf, looks like you have a comment. Uh, yeah, just a, a short one. I'm a big advocate of uh, passive infrastructure. I, uh, in, in my vision, uh, autonomous cars will uh, drive on virtual, uh, uh, I would say, railways even. Uh, that would obviously make the, uh, the problem of keeping the lane uh, much simpler. If you can like, implant infrastructure inside the road, uh, something similar to a very uh, sophisticated RFID tags, uh, in those uh, lane marking or reflectors, that would definitely help. Um, so I think the problem will be easier to solve if we have, the more the passive infrastructure we have, the, uh, the easier the problem will become. Obviously, uh, all of the unexpected, you know, pedestrians jumping in, uh, cars stopping, we still have to have our obstacle detection mechanisms in place and make sure that those work and are reliable. Uh, but it will make the problem easier to solve and handle. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from our audience, and this one's coming from Mitch Nairns. Thank you, Mitch. Um, and the question is really about you know insurance and you know automotive operations worldwide rely on you know the transfer of risk through the purchase of insurance, you know both for material and personal injuries. How can or should or will this affect you know determinations of the cost of associated uh, with the risk transfer? And do you think? Insurance will go up or down, I think maybe is the question. And maybe who buys it? <laughs> I can get a, get a, a started. I think that the insurance, uh, I mean, if the, the autonomous cars will not be reliable enough and they will keep crashing and killing people, obviously people will not want to use them. Uh, it will get to a level that uh, they are so good and there are no accidents, uh, maybe the whole discussion about uh, insurance uh, is not very relevant. So uh, it's an interesting question. Obviously for the intermittent uh, time between uh, now and uh, when the autonomous revolution will actually uh, sweep us all off, off our, our feet and uh, be here. Uh, so for, for that time, uh, right now, uh, it is a big question who is going to take responsibility for uh, for accidents that occur either due to a problem in the algorithms or the hardware that fails in an autonomous vehicle. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Ashley or Niels, anything to add? Seems like, seems like no. All right. Well, Dorota, I might give the floor back to you. All right, thank you, Tyler. Uh, questions keep coming, so it's great. Looks like uh, the audience is really engaged and I thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, what protection are you aware of against intentional sensor spoofing? Do you imagine that signal signatures and using multiple sensors for decision-making will become critical to prevent GNSS, ultrasound, or some other sensor spoofing in the future? Who is going to take, take on it first? Um, I, I'll comment on this because I actually think this is a place where the GNSS community can teach a lot to the rest of the kind of sensor communities. Um, in GNSS, we have very powerful tools to deal with the integrity of signals. And there's, uh, I'm sure the audience probably even knows more than I do about the methods to guarantee integrity of signals. And I think a lot of that is being applied to 
uh, or these similar thoughts are being applied to the sensor data that we get from these other sensors. And yes, uh, that it is quite critical. Um, at this point, I, I don't think that there's anything uh, groundbreaking here yet. Um, it turns out that I think we can transfer a lot of the knowledge that we have from other disciplines of engineering and from GNSS to this domain. Uh, I would uh, also like to answer that question, or at least uh, uh, say something about it. Uh, obviously, coming from the GNSS spoofing detection uh, side, this is uh, something that is close to my heart. And, and I uh, keep asking myself, why, why is it uh, relatively or so easy to spoof GPS receivers today? Uh, and the cost of the attack is very cheap. Uh, we've demonstrated it multiple times on multiple uh, occasions. Uh, for uh, uh, people in the community that follow us and, and what we're doing. Uh, so this problem is, uh, it, it seems that uh, it should have been solved by now, but it hasn't. Uh, and we keep asking ourselves, why uh, is it so easy to spoof a phone that is sitting on the table? Its inertial uh, systems are telling it, you're not moving, yet uh, you're spoofing its GPS and you can uh, make it uh, uh, travel on the highway as if it was uh, driving. Uh, and we didn't have a clear answer why that was uh, so easy to do until we started to develop uh, the countermeasures to detect these kind of attacks and realize that the whole problem revolves around uh, the false positives and how to actually uh, make the system uh, not report these kind of uh, uh, false alerts, especially when you're driving at 100 kilometers an hour on the highway. You don't want a, a false alert, and this is the big challenge today. How do we get the, these spoofing detections, uh, especially around GNSS, to be reliable enough uh, and not to cause any false to cause any false positives? And that's the, that's the big challenge as I see it. Ashley, anything to add? Yeah, um, I think one of the advantages that autonomous vehicles have over GNSS devices in isolation is that we do have access to a lot more sensor data. Um, so if you are doing sensor fusion algorithms between ultrasound, LIDAR, camera, IMU, um, and just knowledge of vehicle dynamics, um, you have a lot more votes in the question of what's trustworthy um, and which sensors agree with each other, which ones don't. Um, so we can take a lot of the concepts from the field and, and put this into our sensor fusion algorithms and really leverage that to the maximum degree possible. All right, thank you for that. And, and um, actually a follow on question quite connected uh, from Karl Kovac, um, thank you for that. And it's uh, to all panelists. Um, do you see much of a difference between the GNSS constellation for use in autonomous vehicles? Is any one better or worse than the other? Who goes first? I don't mind starting. Um, so the nice thing about having multiple options for GNSS constellations is, you know, you get better coverage um, and having multiple GNSS frequencies is also really beneficial. So you can have a, a better estimate of um, between these different sensor signal sources, um, where's your actual vehicle location. Um, and I think that that's really beneficial. And I think one of the things um, that ultimately would be really cool to make use of is can we actually, instead of um, getting one pure GNSS estimate, based on the different measurements that we're getting, have a better estimate of a multimodal distribution of where we could possibly be based on these different sources. Um, this is just, not saying specifically that I've seen this implemented in practice, but I think that has a lot of potential for, for aiding the localization estimate of vehicles, especially in uh, urban canyons and in high multipath environments. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Niels, Joaf, anything to add? I think uh, we, we all agree that not all constellations were made equal. Uh, some have uh, 
better performance than others uh, in, in different regions. I wouldn't, uh, you know, say which one is the best, uh, but we all agree that using all of them or as many of them as possible is always uh, better than using a single one or a, a two of them. Uh, as they say, the more the merrier. All right, thank you. Niels, anything to add? Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, uh, and and I, I won't be baited into naming names of which one's the best because that, that's a dead end. Um, but, but I think there's a couple things that is very exciting and that's quite promising. Uh, I think all the, the advances in and seeing L5 come online is very exciting. Uh, kind of wide band signals uh, is very exciting. Um, it helps a lot with rapid reconvergence, which is, uh, I would call it like a killer feature for GNSS is to get reconvergence to be very fast and have a uh, very good multipath uh, rejection. Um, I think multi-band signals is great because you can remove the IONO effects uh, and like, you can generally improve the, the signals quite a bit. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is seeing how people are starting to do integrity measurements directly from space. So uh, uh, the only one I'm aware of is QZSS in Japan that's doing that, that will transmit integrity signals to end users. I think that's very powerful. And so if I could kind of have a, a dream constellation it would be at least a dual band system with wide band, with rapid reconvergence capabilities um, and, and integrity codes. And so um, pick your favorite constellation that's the closest to that. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Um, Tyler, over to you. Yes, thank you, Dorota. Um, if you'll allow me, I'll, I have a few questions, uh, I guess, for my own curiosity. Um, uh, for our panelists, uh, one of them is, you know, really the classification in autonomy. I think we're all we're all familiar with this system of this, you know, level zero through five. You know, level zero being, you know, completely not autonomous. You know, probably similar to the first car I owned. Um, to you know, this level two autonomy, which is, you know, being, uh, you know, on the road today. You know, styles like things like Tesla autopilot, things like that, um, all the way to these level four and level five systems, which are, you know, so-called fully autonomous systems, uh, which you know, are more akin to the you know, the Waymo, you know, vans and things like that driving around. I guess in your view, you know, in, in working with these systems, um, are there other categories that we should consider based on perhaps operational design domain or otherwise? I'd love to hear your perspective on whether you think that the, you know, this level zero through five is really the right classification or if we should consider something else perhaps. And that's really an open question to our panelists. That's something I've just been curious about for some time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention, uh, I'll comment on that a little bit. Um, I think a theme throughout all of our answers today has been the importance of the, the domain. And I think that's left out of that classification and uh, it, it actually weakens that classification quite a bit. Um, thinking about the domain and how tightly controlled the domain is that we're operating in is, is in many ways a more powerful way to think about autonomy. Um, so I, I, I like to open up like an additional axis. It's kind of your L1, L0 through L5 capabilities of the autonomous vehicle and then the operating design domain and what, what is really being controlled and how tightly is controlled and what can we expect in it. Um, I don't, uh, that being said, the, the levels of autonomy is a useful way to think about this and helps it ex explain to people. Um, I think realistically speaking, there's really only the, um, do we assume that we have a human driver still in the driver's seat that can somehow help us? Uh, or is, the, is, the, is it purely a passenger and there's no steering wheel? And I think that that's maybe in that kind of classification, that's the important split. That's kind of the important step change we go over. Do we have a human operator in the vehicle that can help somehow, whether that is through supervising the vehicle or whether it is through uh, taking over to drive complex environments that the car can't handle itself, or do you necessarily have to do the entire trip autonomously? Um, that, that's kind of a big split in how we approach this. Uh, and then, yeah, and then what's the environment look like? I think it's, those are, those are maybe the two more important questions. So I would almost split this into like, do I have a driver or not? And how tightly controlled is the environment? And Niels, thank you for that. Um, Yoab or Ashley, anything to add? 
No, nothing. All right. Um, I'd like to turn to to our audience again and take a question from from that side. Um, and I'm going to take another question from Mitch, Mitch Narens. Thank you, Mitch, for this one. And, uh, I like this question a lot. And it's the importance of it goes back to the importance of mapping. And you know, in aviation, maps and charts are, are updated on a regular basis. And, and as an example, he gives you know, 56 days and are authenticated and they're certified for use in, in avionics systems. Um, the question is, you know, should similar certifications and update cycles be considered for, you know, for land-based navigation as well? And um, before I sort of open it to the to our panelists, I'd like to give, a, I guess, a, an anecdote from from my experience. Um, there's, uh, you know, when you go around mapping these these places, you see, you know, especially when you take these detailed, you know, three-dimensional maps from from lidar or other sensors, um, you can see pretty clear differences just in the seasons, and that's even true in places like Palo Alto in California, where. You know, Someone like me who's coming from a cold place, is, there's not really any seasons here. <laughs> um, and you, you, even then you, you, you do see a, a pretty big change in that. And it, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite striking to see that if you uh, also map an area where you know, perhaps street cleaning was being done that day, you see that there are no cars parked or there was garbage day or something like that. You see all these objects that are you know, seemingly static objects as part of the map that, that are no longer so. And so I'd love to hear your, all, all of your perspectives who, who work in this industry. What is the right time constant there? And, and, what might that certification process look like if, if there's one that's already sort of in motion? I'm happy to start out. Oh. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think that this is a really interesting question um, and there are a lot of different factors to consider um, because, you know, if, if there's a truck that's parked on the side of a road for a week or a month. Um, do you want that to be part of your map? Um, can you trust that no one's that going to move that truck anytime in the future? Um, how do you decide in an automated fashion um, how many vehicles you need to see a certain map feature before you trust that it's reliable? Um, how long do you need to observe this over time before you want to include it in your map? Um, and then there's also the, the factor of, do you want these updates to be over the air in real time? Um, because if you, if you want something like that, then you need to factor in a communications infrastructure for actually like compressing that data transmitting that data over the air and then having some place to receive and process that data. Um, <clears throat> and is that going to be real time on the car or are you going to do it when the car returns to a service station, for example? Uh, and if you're waiting until it returns to a service station, how much storage do you want on the vehicle in order to hold that information? Um, and very tightly coupled into this fact is what sort of representation of the environment do you have in your map? If it's a point cloud map, the data volumes are going to be massive. Uh, so maybe that implies that you can't actually afford to transfer them over the air, or maybe it implies that you don't have enough room to store a long term amount of data on the vehicle. Um, however, if the data volumes are mass massive, then maybe it's more challenging to actually validate your confidence in those new updates. Um, if your representation of the environment is relatively sparse, um, a distribution of multimodal Gaussians, for example, or landmarks or so, maybe that's actually pretty easy to transfer over the air to other vehicles and do continuous real-time updates. Um, so if it's easy for you to do an update in terms of the data volume, maybe you can afford to update it on a regular cadence or real time even in the car. Um, because if you have the latest information, then maybe you can make use of that. But I think ultimately one of the things we have to consider is do you trust your automated mapping algorithm to be correct and give you good results without any supervision or, or verification? And how often do you wanna schedule um, a QA on your map data, for example. Um, and, and the last final part of that question is how robust is your algorithm to these changes that you're witnessing in the environment? 
So maybe if the change is substantial enough that you're seeing degraded performance in the specific area, you want to target that area for a, a more rapid map update. If you've seen some changes, you've seen them pretty consistently, but you're able to maintain your localization accuracy to the standard that you need, maybe you don't waste your time on the, the cost and infrastructure and effort there to do the update. So it's, it's a really big design space to consider here. Ashley, thank you for that. It seemed like we had um, some additional comments. Uh, perhaps, Niels, you'd like to go first. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just very briefly say I, I think this is a great question. Um, there's two schools of thought that I've run into. One is very much the like uh, in the future HD maps will be um, just completely commodity. Cars will just scan the environment and keep updating it fully automatically. And there's going to be millions of these autonomous vehicles. And so, like while well, we're driving the sensor stack around, so it's basically going to be free. Um, that that is definitely a compelling kind of thought experiment. Uh, I think, from my perspective, the verification and then Ashley was remarking on this: the, the kind of verification and validation of your map, and like performing quality control on your map, is critical, and is also uh, at this point a, 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 a step that involves humans. And so, um, maintaining our maps is expensive and does take time. So. I'm, it's not, if, if, if this question is specifically pertaining to like, do we need kind of a government regulatory body that sets a time constant, something like that. Uh, I think at the moment, that's not necessarily clear to me, but, um, but yes, we, we already do certification of our maps through quite a complex involved QA process and, and it's, it's critical. And so if you do think in the direction of like, well, if somebody were to try and do uh, kind of turn maps into a commodity, then yes, like that certifying the map is critical. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Um, Yoav, anything to add? Nothing. Uh, Dorota, I might turn the floor back to you. All right, thank you, Tyler. And I've been uh, reading the Q&A box and I love a question from Todd Kawakami. Thank you for that. It's a different question. So many people spend countless hours personally maintaining and modifying the cars for performance or looks. Uh, think of monster trucks or uh, street, uh, street racers. Uh, poor maintenance or extensive modification might significantly alter handling or other characteristics which um, could impact the performance of the autonomous systems. What do you think about the need to create regulations or laws um, for vehicle with autonomous capabilities to have scheduled inspections and to have only certified mechanics conduct proper timely maintenance or installed approved aftermarket modifications? Wow, cool questions. Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot say how it is in the US. I know that here in Israel, at least, it is very uh, difficult to make uh, even the smallest modification. Uh, you go through yearly inspection and if anything is different than how the car was sold to you by, uh, by the dealership, uh, you won't uh, pass the, the yearly inspection. So I'm not sure how it is in the US. Um, I can respond to this as somebody who's spent significant amounts of time altering their, their car. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and, and, and I think there's there's a, there's a cool question here about kind of the enthusiastic car market separate from the autonomous world. And for us, this is a strong argument why uh, we want to own a fleet of vehicles. Um, even just the, the calibration of sensors is something that is useful to check regularly and make sure that your entire sensor suite is well calibrated and well registered to each other. And um, it, at least for a fully autonomous vehicle, uh, that seems like a problem that's easier to just solve internally rather than say, oh, this is a car we'll sell to human, uh, to, to, to drivers, to the public, and then try to maintain this. In terms of solving it technically, um, Ashley can probably remark on this as well, because a lot of this is, is a verification process. It's like, how do you do online verification, which we have some tools to do. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think ultimately it's about um, really meticulously defining the requirements for our system 
and understanding what sort of center of mass modifications and things of that nature we're robust to and we can handle with our online calibration algorithms. Um, and and I, I think you brought up a really good point that, you know, going in for regular maintenance might actually be a lot more frequent with autonomous vehicles to maintain calibration, um, especially if this sort of stuff is going on. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, depending on the amount of passengers and distribution of passengers inside of the car for any given trip, even if, if um, the car company owns a fleet of mobility on demand autonomous vehicles, we do have to account for weight imbalances and uh, slightly different configurations um, as the vehicle is driving. You know, even something as simple as the tire pressure is changing in the car because the temperature is different. That might also affect uh, the drift rate of your gyroscopes and your IMU. Um, so all of these things are things we have to consider. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to follow on uh, with, with one other question um, from, from John Levrakis, um, who refers to uh, being in a very crowded um, city somewhere in China. And we know that there are lots of places when there's a lot of mixed traffic. And, and, and John observed cars weaving out in and out of traffic, along with people crossing the streets and mopeds crisscrossing pedestrians and traffic. Do you see autonomous vehicles as being able to detect and respond to situation like this? Will the autonomous car weave through traffic just as well, or will it stop in confusion? Who's taking it from here? I don't mind chiming in here. Um, I you. think that this is a really challenging uh, operational design domain to try and handle. Um, and I think that there are reasons why autonomous vehicle companies are mostly focusing on different cities uh, that don't have that, that high volume of traffic participant unpredictability, as it were. Um, just my own personal experience uh, and opinion, one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, Space has a lot of challenges, but it's pretty easy because you're dealing with physics constraints. You're not really dealing with people constraints. And I think that the more and more you have to interact with, with people who are non-deterministic, uh, they're somewhat predictable, but not entirely predictable. It, it adds a whole nother level to the technical challenge. Um, that's one of the fun things we get to try and tackle. Um, but I, I don't see that sort of area happening as quickly as as AV development in other types of regions and traffic scenarios. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to this as well. Um, I, I don't think we need to solve that problem. Like you're right that that's clearly a much more challenging case. I think the societal benefit of having large scale autonomous vehicles and uh, like if we can reduce carbon emissions from vehicle manufacture, from mining, from having to produce the amount of vehicles on the road by like an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, the societal benefit is so massive that the idea of like, well, perhaps we have to control these environments more, which we already do for things like highway driving, um, I think is, is an approach that I'm personally excited about. Of course, what will happen is, is an entirely open question. Um, you know, we don't know. Uh, and uh, at least for us, we can do quite complex maneuvers and handle quite complex environments in today's cities already. Um, uh, of course, for us, autonomous vehicles, um, we, d we follow the rules of the road. So at least when it comes to like, will you be weaving in and out of traffic the way you see uh, human drivers do? The answer is no, like we won't be breaking the rules of the road the way that human drivers often do. You have any comments? All right, um, Tyler, over to you. I said, Jerona, thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to start with, um, I guess, uh, another question from my side. And I would just love to hear your vision on how you see the autonomous rollout happening. And I know we're already we're already seeing this to some extent, and you know how 
you know, some of these, uh, you know, driver assistance systems are coming to highway applications and, and already being available in, in consumer vehicles today. Um, and not, not so much the case yet with the full, fully autonomous systems. Uh, I'd love to see, you know, how you see that relo happening. You see that happening, you know, first with perhaps highway systems, you know, driver assistance systems. Uh, you know, will we ever be able to buy a fully autonomous system or will, it, will this be a, you know, a ride sharing only service or something like this nature? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear, love to hear your, uh, your vision as to how you see this, this rolling out. Who, who'd like to take this one first? Very good. This, I see Niels is unmuted. So. This, is a, this is a fun question. So yeah, I, I want to comment on that. <laughs> um, uh, I think the, the rollout for us is very much, um, as I've already talked about, uh, like multimodal trips. The, and, and this is for example, this is also happening in the trucking industry as an example where autonomous trucking uh, is also an example where doing fully autonomous highway uh, trucking between um, depots, between transfer depots, and then having uh, human drivers drive the last mile, for example, is uh, kind of a, a natural intermediate step. Um, the same thing is true here. Like, uh, I don't expect, at least in the near term, autonomous vehicles to suddenly be uh, the primary and only way that I travel everywhere. Uh, we already have a multimodal transportation network. And generally, we see autonomous vehicles as fitting into that. The idea of like, uh, c currently in many parts of the world, especially here in San Francisco, we have many streets closed to vehicles so that people have outdoor space during the pandemic. Uh, and it's lovely. You have lots of extra space and using uh, small scooters, skateboards, micro mobility type uh, vehicles to get around short distances is awesome. And then being able to transfer from that to public transportation for longer distances or air travel for truly long, longer distances. I think autonomy naturally fits into that stack. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Ashley, are, are you of anything to add? Sure. Um, I think we've already started to see uh, some of this rollout process happening. Um, a couple of years ago, the thought of autonomous driving um, was really important to some people and, and the question was continually asked, will people accept it? Um, would anyone trust this sort of system? And we've seen the, the rollout of more and more driver assist systems, particularly in highway driving um, with adaptive cruise control and distance keeping from other vehicles and lane keeping. And I think that that has really started acclimating people to the thought of trusting a vehicle to drive them someplace, um, which I think is really valuable and beneficial. And then on the level four, level five side of things, the, the typical approach that you've seen in a couple different companies is starting out with a shuttle route, a, a predefined path that the vehicle is going to take um, in a possibly private area, more controlled environment, such as like company campuses uh, or, or gated areas. Um, and you can really start trying out your system there in a more controlled fashion, which is really nice. And then, and then as you really nail that ODD, you start expanding. Um, and the approach that Argo is taking is this street by street, block by block approach. So once we narrow down like one area, we're really good in this area, then we can start incrementally adding and expanding to that area as we go. Um, and I think the, the incremental approach is really valuable um as far as where we go in the future i guess we'll see what happens well that sounds great and uh, you have uh, anything to add <laughs> very good um i'd like to take another question from our audience here and, and i think there are two questions here which are, are related so i'd like to kind of put them together uh, and the first one is from uh, marco mendonka and the question is do you think that the user of autonomous vehicles should have any control or the fine tuning of the vehicle? So for example, tuning whether the vehicle should prioritize passengers or pedestrians, uh, removing some of the burden uh, from the manufacturer regarding uh, ethical decisions. Um, but I think a, a somewhat related element to this as well as, um, and this is coming from um, Jeff uh, Jeff Rizowski, um, on, the on the topic of people constraints, you know, have you experienced, you know, 
people constraints in terms of you know changing the characteristics of the ride. So you know with active you know suspension, uh, you know being able to adjust things for nausea, for discomfort. Uh, you know I have heard of some stories myself of some of these autonomous vehicles, although you know being very cautious and, and generally being very safe, they're a little erratic in their behavior sometimes. And so uh, those questions are a little bit together on, on the to on the topic of tuning these things. And so I'd love to hear your your perspective on that. I can take uh, part of that. I, I believe in the freedom within limits. Um, obviously, if a manufacturer tunes the car uh, in a way that you really hate and you don't enjoy riding it, uh, you should be able to modify it at least to make it uh, the ride a little more comfortable for you. Whether you do it by yourself or go to the garage and, and ask them to change uh, the suspension a bit or um, uh, a bit of deceleration and the braking or whatever makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, we should allow that at least a little bit of freedom to do that, yeah. Uh, Ashley. Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, about the, the ethics question um, and the safety question, I don't think we can really afford to compromise on ethics and safety for the sake of um, personal preferences, but I think that uh, reflecting personal driving preferences in vehicle is something that does currently exist um, in standard like commercial cars that you can purchase for your own use. Um, so I could see where that would reasonably extend to autonomous driving. Uh, you know, I used to have a, a Volkswagen car that had sport mode in it. And depending if you were in regular driving mode or sport mode, the anti-lock brake system would behave very differently. Um, so you had three levels of, of selection there in terms of like the conservative anti-lock braking, the sport mode braking, and turning it off completely yourself. But um, within each of those different levels that you could choose from, the car still had to be safe and meet certain regulations. Um, so I could see it being reasonable that as long as we could still make those guarantees, um, you could choose the difference between maybe being a little car sick, but getting to your destination 10% faster. Uh, that could be reasonable. Ashley, thank you. Uh, Neil, looks like you just unmuted. Yes, I, I'd love to add to this as well. Yeah. Um, uh, at Uber, we think a lot about three aspects of our self-driving cars. We think about uh, prime, number one always is safety. Um, how do they perform around hazards? Then number two is our ability to make progress. How well are we performing to get to our goal? Uh, and then the third, which is uh, equally critical, is rider comfort. Um, we, uh, across the organization, measure our performance on bad experiences and how many bad experiences occur across a trip. Um, and uh, this this has th this perspective uh, on absolutely wanting a, a five star ride experience every time uh, drives a significant amount of our development. Um, the smoothness of our trajectories, the uh, the space that we give other vehicles. Uh, there's the kind of an interesting discovery is that um, you can often be safe. Uh, as by any of our regulatory standards and even kind of holding a very, very high bar to safety and still feel a little uncomfortable um, as a rider and say, ah, oh, this feels a little bit close to that car or you feel like you're moving a little bit fast here. Um, and so we take, uh, we, we go above and beyond our vehicle's performance to ensure rider comfort. Uh, an interesting thing here that, that I think is pretty cool is how you can start bringing in personal preference. Now, you're kind of alluding to the, the ride experience. Um, there's much more to that as well, like having your personal preference for the, uh, the AC settings in the vehicle, the music that's playing, the lighting. Um, do you, yeah, are you particularly prone to motion sickness? And we should particularly crank down any jerk limits on trajectories. All of those are things that we can do in autonomous vehicles. And for us, a big part of the kind of appeal of these autonomous vehicles is that we can have an incredibly high quality ride experience. That's very important to us. And our, uh, our self-driving cars, um, it's, it's, some, it's, it's being driven by 
it, it is as if you're being driven by a very, very professional, personal driver. And so it, uh, because of that, we tr really try to take into account all of these factors and personalize it. Um, we're, we're not personalizing something like safety and to Ashley's point, like uh, th those are not things that you will have control over. And I don't think those are things you should have control over, but in terms of what your experience is and what's your kind of personal preferences for how you like to be driven, uh, absolutely. Do you like having the music on or not? Yeah, all of those are things that you will have control over, which I think is a pretty, pretty sweet experience. Very good, very good. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess one more question from my side, and that is, you know, do you agree with the recent headlines? Are we decades away from autonomous vehicles, or are we closer than that? I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on when we'll see these vehicles out, out and about. I think we're decades from uh, from being there. Um, I think the main challenge again is to how do we uh, cross the gap uh, between uh, the mix of autonomous vehicles and uh, human drivers and pedestrians, uh, and that whole uh, uh, big mix. And I think it will. I thought initially, uh, maybe 20 years ago, that it will be much faster. Uh, but I was wrong, and I don't think uh, that even uh, as I see the technology advance today, I still don't see it uh, coming in the in the next uh, five ten years. Uh, Ashley or Niels, anything to add there? Okay. Um, I just say I think our industry has. Uh, really done ourselves a disservice by trying to make these predictions and yeah. hence the headlines. So I, I will not add to that noise. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, I think we can all at least say that perhaps we have job security for, for some time. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, but with that, Dorota, I'll, I'll turn the floor back to you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I just noticed um, a really, um, Cool question came to the Q&A box um, from Lakshi Narola. Um, we don't expect autonomous vehicles to drive as aggressively as human drivers, well, at least some. Um, would you say it is obvious that trip times for autonomous taxis would be longer than human-driven taxis? I think taxi drivers would tell you that it's for sure. Um, if so, and if human-driven and autonomous-driven taxis are priced competitively, then would consumers not just choose human-driven taxis? And a follow-on question to it, how might these sorts of discussions influence decisions to put in infrastructure like AV-only lanes? Niels, wanna take a, Ashley, you just unmuted, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I think drive time is definitely one uh, optimization criteria when you're thinking about what do you value in a taxi ride. Um, but I think that uh, the comfort of the acceleration profile and the smoothness of the ride is another factor. Um, Probably somebody with young children might want something that's extra safe rather than something that's extra fast, but maybe a little bit aggressive. Um, so it's, it's all about personal preference. Like, do you want a system that is going to have sensors that maybe see further with their, with their superhuman sensing, as Neil said earlier? Um, and do you value safety? Do you value ride smoothness? And maybe people just think that technology is cool. Personally, I would ride in an autonomous vehicle just because it's, it's really exciting. It's kind of the next wave of, of evolution in our transportation system. Um, so I, I find that awesome enough to want to ride in one anyway. Um, yeah, so, so I think there are a couple of different factors here. Uh, in addition to just ride time. And you know, maybe you also have introverts who don't want the pressure of socializing with the taxi driver and just want to sit alone in the autonomous vehicle and let the robot car drive them where they want to go. Um, or maybe you have a really clo close group of five friends and you don't fit in a regular taxi with the driver. So you can fit one more friend in the car with you. Um, yeah, 
lots of different things factor into it. So I, I don't see ride time as, as a blocking factor here. Well, but when, when I love your point, Ashley, about the driver who wants to become friends the moment you <laughs> you get the the airport after 24 hours on your flight and you just want to get home <laughs> rather than socialize. Um, Niels and or Oyov, any comments from your side? All right. Um, there's a question in the box. Um, um, I was wondering if you would want to um, answer. It's a little bit. Um, high level technical but let me let me try it refers to the lidar data and and um, your thoughts about um, regarding ai applied to lidar data of course the lidar data nature is quite different from from the regular um, image um, data it's sparse it's unordered and need to be invariant under geometric transformations um, so any thoughts about lidar data and ai yeah, this is, this is a great question. I, I love getting into kind of the technical details. And this has been a challenge that uh, so much of our computer vision is built around beautiful, regular 2D grids of pixels. And now suddenly you have got this unstructured 3D voxels. Um, I would really refer this person to go look at the Uber ATG's research publication website. We have uh, I, I open it up quickly and we have at least a dozen papers that's all deep learning methods applied to uh, to LIDAR data. And this is kind of a very cool cutting edge field where like all the papers are in the last um, two years, maybe a little bit more. So yes, uh, I think this is actually an area where working with unstructured data and figuring out how to do that is kind of an exciting area that machine learning is busy forging into. And if this is the kind of stuff that you're asking and the kind of questions we like to ask, um, we're hiring aggressively. So talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you for that, Niels. It was great passage. Um, um, Joaf, Ashley, anything to add? Nope. All right. So there is one other uh, question. Um, how strongly does the aspects of space weather affect autonomous driving? And what can we do about it to overcome this issue? And um, I'm thinking this is not just GNSS. Maybe there are other aspects of space weather that impact other sensors. Who could take up on this question? All right, I guess we just um, leave that question open and ask it some other panel. <laughs> I, I, can, you know. I can take a stab at it if nobody else would like to. Um, yeah, so I, I think that we all are familiar with the impacts of space weather on GNSS quality. Um, and I think that off of the top of my head, that's really the biggest impact on autonomous driving. So um, the amount that it affects our vehicles is really going to be dependent on how strongly they rely on GNSS as part of their localization subsystem. Um, what can we do about it to overcome the issue? Multiple sensor modalities. Uh, I feel like a broken record. But yeah, I, I think that's it's a short answer, high level, but I, I think that's the most that can be said about that. All right, I just, I just wanna add one comment. Yeah, when I was looking at this question, I was like, it's inevitably GNSS and space weather um, because we talk about so much about GNSS. So to the person who asked the question, I may suggest if you have interest in space weather and aspect of um, impact on GNSS and, and things we might possibly do, I would suggest you contact uh, Dr. Jade Morton from the University of Colorado. She lives in space, so she would be very, very happy to answer this question. All right, um, there is no more questions in the box and I have just one question left on my list. And I know that uh, many of you touched upon this aspect before, but if you could maybe um, make some, uh, some comments um, about the acceptance level, we talk about technological barriers, regulations, and, and all the cool things that we kind of have more control of. The question is now how 
the societies would accept the technology. And, and Ashley, I think you touched upon this quite a bit, but um, if you could comment more on how you expect how fast the te this technology would be accepted by different societies and would that be um, different, you know, with geo different geographic locations and different um, cultures? Yeah, you know, I think that we've seen a really rapid acceptance um, in the US so far. Um, or at least I've been pleasantly surprised by, by how quickly these technologies are getting integrated in some of our commercial vehicle products. Um, you know, even if they're not level four or level five, I think level two and level three, that still adds a lot of value and, and helps dip our toes in the water of autonomy. Um, on the same hand, you know, I think this varies country by country. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, but recently in the news, Germany has outlawed Tesla from advertising their systems here in this country because they say that uh, the ads are misleading and imply that it's a fully autonomous system when it's actually not, and that can cause a safety hazard by people placing too much trust in the system than is really like guaranteed by the, the providers. Um, so I think that this is definitely going to be a, a culture by culture thing. Um, yeah, I, I think that we can get there, but I think it'll happen at different speeds depending on, on the different value systems. Thank you for that. Um, Niels, you are? I think, I think uh, geography matters a lot. Also, uh, uh, the regime in a specific country, uh, take China, for example. Uh, I, I see it. Uh, I've been to China the first time in 2001, I think. Uh, and the amount of uh, uh, scooters, uh, gasoline-powered scooters, there was, uh, was huge. Uh, and it was like total mayhem in the streets, bicycles, uh, scooters, uh, crisscrossing the streets. And the next time I was there was uh, only a, a, a year or a year and a half ago. And things have changed so dramatically. Uh, I don't see it happening in other countries so fast. So I think if the government wants, uh, I can say, wake up one day and say, uh, I don't allow any uh, non-autonomous uh, cars uh, driving in that part of the city or in that part of the neighborhood. Uh, I, I see it uh, as a very feasible uh, option. Uh, so that might drive adoption uh, in certain countries uh, much faster than in other countries. Thank you. Uh, Niels, anything to add? Um, I don't think I really have much to add. I think uh, it's pretty well covered, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, Tyler, over to you. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, you know, thank you all, all of our participants for, the, for all those great questions. I think that um, uh, that's that's the end of the question sort of session and here. I think that we've come to the point where we can uh, begin our, our sort of concluding remarks. And so I know some of our panelists had asked to, to, to do so. And um, Niels, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to everybody here. It's, it's great to be here. Um, we are, like I said, we're actively hiring. And so if you're interested in this field, uh, please do talk to me and look at our careers page because we'd love to have more people come and work on this problem. Um, Ashley. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to say thanks for, for inviting me to this panel and thanks for all of the really great questions and the fun discussion. Um, I think that it's really encouraging to see uh, all parties that are invested in this problem and this technology from regulation to implementation to tangential fields like GNSS that really support this technology development. Um, and I think by continuing to all like have these open discussions and working together to really push it forward, um, I think I see a lot of potential here and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. And we're also hiring. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, Yoav. Uh, yeah, 
I also want to thank everybody. Uh, it was a very interesting panel. I, I really enjoyed uh, being a member. Uh, the questions were extremely interested, and I have to say that uh, I personally learned uh, a lot of new things, both from uh, the questions and panelists. So yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank, thank, thanks to all of you. And to, to give a few remarks myself, I just want to say a, you know, big thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, I also learned a lot today, and I think that it's important to keep these kinds of discussions going and keep them open, as, as was mentioned. So we really appreciate you taking the time and, and also just giving your perspective. Um, I'd also like to thank our, um, our ION staff for, for making this, this possible. I think that this was a, as smooth as it could be, uh, not, not because of us, but because of, uh, of the staff <laughs> and, and chasing us down and getting this going. So we really appreciate you, know, you making that happen, especially with, uh, you know, with all the uncertainty surrounding COVID. I think that this came together very well, you know, all things considered. Um, and really a big thanks to all of our, all of our, uh, our participants today. I think we, it was great to see all the engagement and all, all the great questions there. And I think it did exactly what we hoped it to, which was to you know, provoke you know, all these thoughts and, and discussion. And I think we had a great showing. We think on average, we had something like 140 participants uh, stay with us almost the whole time. And so we're really glad to see that. And yeah, I appreciate all of you uh, making, uh, making this panel a great one. And then I'd also like you know, to thank Dorota. You know, thank you for, for, uh, for, for doing this with me and I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Tyler. I just, I just wanna echo what Tyler just said. Um, many thanks to the panel and to Tyler. Tyler, you have to admit you've done all the heavy lifting. I, I, I'm just assisting <laughs> and I'm happy to do so. Thank you so much for, um, for being on top of things. And um, we are very grateful to the panel. I think we all admit um, openly, we learn a lot and I look forward to having you again in the next meeting because this topic is not gonna go away until we have autonomy. And we decided today it's not gonna happen for a few decades, right? <laughs> so there's a long way to go and multiple PhD um, dissertations to be written. So once again, I uh, look forward to more conversations, more discussions. Uh, thank you to the audience for fantastic engagement and great um, challenging questions. Um, and of course, again, a thank you to IU and staff. I want to echo what um, what Tyler said. It's very smooth. It's it's fantastic. What I'm missing is the is the schmoozing and the tea and and coffee and what have you. And I certainly hope that the next meeting is going to happen in three dimensions. I really am missing all of you guys, and I would love to see everyone in person. Thank you again, and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank Taylor. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.